first on the agenda is liquor control. Oh, we have to approve the minutes first, don't we? Yeah. Okay. And there's no agenda changes. All right. On my part. Sorry. Um, I'd like to um, um, ask for a, a motion for the uh, minutes. Approve the minutes. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of July 17th. Have a motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? <coughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Motion has passed. Minutes have passed. All right. Actually, no, she didn't ask for changes. Though. No, she just said there was no changes. Okay. There's no regular liquor licenses. There's no regular tobacco license okay, thank either. You. Um, so I'm going to jump down to special event permits. There are two. One is Soulmate um, Brewing Company on September 30th from 9.30 to 6 at Rocktoberfest at um, 74 Portland Street. And we should do each separate. Okay. Okay. Um, Trish is going to speak about it if you have any questions on behalf of Jonathan, um, who is out of town. Okay. Trisha, would you like to share anything? He's gone through DLC. Uh, we spoke with Jason. He's all okay about this. What he's looking to do is just open up a bigger space. He will have it all corded off like you have to do for any of these events. I think it's a great addition to Rocktoberfest. All right. Any any questions or discussion from the board? So is he, uh, Trish, is he going to be on the, the sidewalk or is this <laughs> going to be inside the... He, he's going to be on the sidewalk and he's going to come out to two parking spaces directly in front of him. He's going to make like a, a little oasis there and it will be completely corded off by um, DLC standards, what he has to do. He has spoken with them. I um, Like I said, in the past, you know, we've had Moogs. I mean, years ago, we had a rotary tent. Um, I, I personally think this is good. Some places sit outside, listen to live music. Really good. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I was just wondering if he was going to be outside or well, maybe yeah, even it's in all outside. Yeah, uh, he says nine thirty a.m., but when will he actually start pouring beer? At nine thirty. <laughs> I, I wouldn't that's that wouldn't be anything to do with me i mean he well, probably is setting up at 9 30. right I, was, I mean i can't imagine he's going to be pouring beer before noon well i think it would be nice to know what hours he's pouring alcohol that's what's on his application oh. does it say I, yeah what i put in there 9 30 to 6. <clears throat> so i guess it's five o'clock somewhere 9 30 a.m mm -hmm. yeah he's gonna be serving beer yep the event doesn't open till 10 o'clock so i'm just a messenger i know i that's do i have a motion i'll second that i we need a motion first oh we'll make a motion we'll make a motion to accept soulmate breweries um application for the 30th from 9.30 to 6. Great. A second? And I'll second that. Um, Jason, any concerns? No concerns. I spoke to John. He reached out to me and made sure I was okay with it. And I said, as long as he uh, conforms to the D, uh, DOC or to DLC's regs, then it's fine with me. Okay. And if we had other <clears throat> events that were. Yeah, we've done this with like Moose Joint down at the Oxbow. Were, we were serving beer at 10. I don't know about 10. I'm not sure what time those events. I'd have to go back and look. I don't know off the top of my head. The rotary tent that we did originally with Rocktoberfest opened right at 10 o'clock, right when we did uh, the day, start of the day. And that was like, I think the second year we did Rocktoberfest. So it was like 10 years ago now. Interesting. I'm just surprised the DLC. I used to run the Vermont Brewers Festival. So I'm really surprised that the DLC did that. Well, yep. the DLC. DLC doesn't do it. The, they have to issue the liquor permit for him well, to pour. The applicant can ask whatever they want. Yeah. So the DLC hasn't even seen it yet. You see it before it'll go to them. So yeah. if you want to change the time. I think if there's a restriction, they'll probably yeah, restrict that's, it. Yeah, okay, that's what I was asking was, so he hasn't gotten the DLC yet. No. First it comes to you, and you can um, put any stipulations you want on it. And So then... Trish, didn't you just say that the DLC had approved this? He talked to DLC before he applied. 
as Sarah had said to me that he needed to talk to them about what his guidelines were and what he's required to do for this. But he doesn't. So I would, I would say that we need to hold off until that DLC permit. DLC permit. We can't. We can't uh, hold off, Laura. This event no, is you. You. Um, how the Got process it. works is you approve first, right. and then the DLC just signs off it. So if there's stipulations, this is when it's made. Not not at the DLC. The the stipulations are made at the local level. And we don't have another meeting before September 30th either. Yeah. This isn't unusual. Like the the Sto eight miler, they the Sto eight miler start the ra road race started at eight, eight in the morning, and at ten mm -hmm. o'clock you could go get a beer when you finish the road race. I mean, it's not apples to apples, but it's not yeah okay outside of yeah that. I'm just I'm kind of surprised. I'm, I'm, DLC. Yeah. That's yeah. That's not how it was. Fine. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. So the motion is passed. Thank you. Thank you, Trish. Uh, the next one is from D Black Diamond Barbecue on December 2nd from 5 to 11 p.m. at um, Concept 2 for their holiday party. I don't know if Jason's here. He's not, no. Or here. I asked him to to reach out to our Jason. I don't know if he did. And I invited him to the meeting. I don't I don't know anything and my husband's a concept two <laughs> employee and I asked him and he doesn't know anything. This would be a private party then. Yeah, I think it's a private party. And this is at concept two. And it's not at, at concept two. Not at Black Diamond. Uh, I'll make a motion that we uh, accept the uh, Get permission for Black Diamond Barbecue, uh, December second, five to eleven p.m. for their holiday, the Concept Two holiday party. I have a motion. I have a second. I'll second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? All right. Aye. Motion is passed. Uh, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. <clears throat> And before I make a motion, I just want to say uh, I made a note of this. It's nice to see Soulmate finally opened up. So congratulations to them. Uh, I'll make a motion to adjourn from the Board of Liquor and Tobacco Control. I'll second. Got a motion, a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. We are adjourned. Thank you, Sarah. And opening up the select board meeting. Any additions or changes to the agenda? None. Looking for a motion to approve the minutes from 9-11-2023. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes from 9-11. I'll second. And a motion is second. Any discussion? No. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Motion, the minutes have been accepted. First, new business, remove Angela Cody from the Morristown Conservation Commission. Make sure you introduce us <coughs> yourself. Ron Stankler, chair of the Morristown Conservation Commission. This is an easy one to explain. Unfortunately, the young lady moved to Waterville, and so our bylaws say you have to be a resident of the town of Morristown. But maybe someday in the future, if she can find a place to live in Morristown, then she might be back with us. But So um, you go ahead and act on that, and I'll stay right here for the next item on the agenda. Okay. <laughs> so, Ron, are we accepting a resignation, or are we just removing her? Her resignation. Okay. Yeah. So I'd make a motion to accept the resignation of Angela Cody from the Morristown Conservation Commission. I will second. So we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? <clears throat> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, motion is passed. We're gonna go to number two. Okay, next I'll item. Read it. Approve a, appointing Jerry Throne to the Morristown Conservation Commission. We moved our meeting up to, uh, from this Thursday to last week Thursday because the individual that is interested in joining us was going to be out of town. And so uh, <clears throat> Jerry Thorne, who is, Thorne, who is here tonight, 
uh, excuse me, <laughs> um, has been at quite a few of our meetings over the past year. He lives here in the village. Uh, he's an engineer, also, like I am. And he submitted the, uh, his uh, resume to our group, and we interviewed him in a little more detail last week, Thursday, but our board was unanimous in uh, selecting him to join our group. And so I'd like the select board to uh, appoint him, please. Now, Mr. Phone is here tonight, so I'll invite him up to the mic so you can ask any questions of him. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Hi. Tell us um, why you'd like to serve on the board. Well, I'm very much uh, interested in uh, conserving our natural resources and uh, all, all the things that uh, make uh, Marstown uh, you know, a unique and wonderful place to, to live. And uh, so I, I just want to do uh, the best I can to uh, uh, accomplish that. And, uh, and that's why I, uh, I'm interested in the Conservation Commission. I've, uh, as Ron said, I've attended uh, most of the meetings uh, over the last uh, uh, almost two years now. And uh, so uh, I think I'm very much familiar with uh, what their, uh, their goals are and uh, what uh, uh, they try to accomplish. And, and I've, I've worked with them in uh, 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 putting up signs, preserving uh, trails, building parts of the, of the trail system in the, in the Marstown Forest. And uh, so I'm uh, very much uh, uh, enthused about uh, uh, joining that group. Can I just, um, I know, but other people, just uh, your background, how it applies um, to this work also? Sure. I think that's uh, great. So uh, I uh, have degrees uh, in, in the engineering field uh, uh, that aren't particularly uh, uh, assignable to uh, conservation, but still uh, engineering in, in general. And uh, I've, I've also uh, worked uh, all my, all my uh, working life uh, in the construction business. Uh, I, w I was an a project engineer, project manager, surveyor, um, and uh, uh, also a, a chief estimator for a large construction company uh, in the suburbs of Philadelphia. So I have a, a, a great uh, uh, amount of knowledge uh, about different types of uh, uh, construction. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Don, Richard, do you have any questions? No. no, I would just, the only thing I was going to add, Jerry, is not only it sounds like you've, you've been to a lot of conservation commission meetings, but you've been in this room quite a bit for select board meetings and shown a lot of interest in this town and provided a lot of helpful thoughts and comments. So I appreciate that. Yes, thank you. I would make the motion to approve appointing Jerry Throne to the Morristown Conservation Commission. I will second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Motion and thank you. Passed. And welcome aboard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thanks, Ryan. I made a mistake and I didn't read a statement at the beginning of the meeting and I apologize for that. Mm -hmm. And this statement's going to be on our agenda coming forward. It wasn't able to be on there today. I think Dawn has read part of the statement before other meetings. Just gives us some structure to our meetings. Select board members will discuss the agenda items before opening the discussion to the public. So we'll have our discussion up here, and then we'll open it to the public. Comments from the public on the agenda items will be taken for two minutes per person, with each person being allowed to speak a second time after everyone in attendance has had a chance to be heard. The community comment section, which is at the end of the meeting, um, those items will provide an opportunity for the community members to speak once, for two minutes each to share their perspective with the select board. For topics raised that are not on the agenda, the select board may answer a question, but one should not expect a two-way dialogue nor any actions to be taken. The board will listen carefully to inform if the public, if the topic may be included in future agendas. So you'll have that on your agenda so it mm -hmm. doesn't have to be read at each meeting next time. Thank you. Uh, number four, review delinquent property number tax. Three. Number three. three. Oh, I'm still sorry. Three. I don't know. I skipped <laughs> right okay. over that. <laughs> approve uh, approve improvements <clears throat> to Beaver Meadow Road to allow passage for logging equipment. So I'm going to turn that over to Don. 
Yes. I, I'll take it. Um, we have a couple of people in the audience right now that can help answer questions. Harper, I forget your last name. I, Harper Phillips and Jed Lipsky are here. Harper is the landowner. Jed is, uh, owns a logging company and would be doing the work up in that area. Myself, Jason, Kevin Barrows, who's in the audience as well tonight. Harper and Jed and Jed's son and myself went up to to look at this this morning. And we're, the improvements would be to the class four Beaver Meadow Road. So beyond the parking lot, the new parking lot that's there. And uh, I think we counted four water bars that would be uh, not created, but simply improved. Um, and the culverts all seem to be fine as is, so that's good news. Uh, I know there will be some fill brought in to protect that one culvert that we looked at. But in my opinion, having been up there, it's, it's, uh, it's a win-win for the town because we have a property owner that's willing to come in and uh, take on the expense of... Uh, helping maintain an important road. And for those of us that have been up in the Beaver Meadow area, we know that area gets a tremendous amount of, uh, tremendous amount of foot and bicycle traffic. And um, so anything that we can do to maintain that road and keep it going is, you know, in my opinion, a great idea. So I would encourage the board to, you know, to a, a approve these improvements. And again, there's some people in the room that can answer some questions if there's any additional questions. Yeah. I'm curious if, uh, is this an ongoing or is this a one time to facilitate the lo current logging? Which is this you talk to the microphone, introduce yourself, please. Thank you. Harper Phillips, um, owner of, Beaver, of some land up on Beaver Meadow. Um, what was your question? So is, uh, are you anticipating that this application, is it for a one time you're logging it or are you anticipating that every two years I'm anticipating maintaining the road as, as need be. This is just more than normal just because he has to get okay. a log truck, big logging equipment okay. up in there. But I still drive my pickup truck in there to access my land. Yeah. So I, you know, will maintain it, but probably okay. not this scope of, like yeah. I don't have any intention oh, okay. of plowing it or doing anything like that. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Any other questions? Um, I have a question about how this project I know there's discussion earlier this spring about a class four road policy and I don't really know where that ended up being um, and I my I don't I think it needs to be consistent no matter where the what the road is that's my only question slash concern um, I that's just something that I'd like to you know have some clarification on from because I'm, I'm new, so yeah, yeah and it's a good question, and because I, I it needs to be consistent in my in my mind. It can't absolutely, be. absolutely. <laughs> so I'll just say really quickly before Kevin speaks that I, you know I believe it is consistent with the class four policy, and I think what they're asking to be done is very similar to what we approved on Ron Terrell Road, and also very similar to what's uh, been approved on Blue Moose okay. Road. Right. Yeah. Correct. I agree okay. 100 with that. All right. All right. That's my, that was my, yeah. So we're no, not setting precedence here. Right. Yeah. It's a good okay. question. Thank you. Thank you. Come up and come up to, the speak to the mic and just introduce yourself. Thank you. If Jed Lipsky, uh, resident of Stowe, Vermont, and a logging contractor for 56 years. Uh, I have a summary based on our morning's meeting. So it's crystal clear and I'll leave this with you and you can keep it on the record. Uh, n number one, uh, remove overhanging tree, trees, tree limbs, brush, required to open canopy enough so a log truck and logging equipment can pass without damage. Remove cover, remove or cover small rocks and boulders in the road that could possibly cause tire or rim damage. Three, open existing water bars, approximately four, as Mr. McDowell said, to mitigate water running down the slope of, of the class four road, and discharge it off to the side where they were where they were put in and intended to uh, discharge water. 
Uh, we would uh, add some minimal material uh, gravel, probably uh, processed gravel to prevent pooling and standing water in the road and to cover exposed culverts to prevent damage to those culverts, some of which have been put in by the town in the last few years, but they do need additional cover. Five, clean up drainage ditch and add material to cover culvert on approach to snowmobile bridge to improve drainage and prevent culvert damage from logging equipment. Six, and finally, add some boulders and stone and gravel on the outside radius of the turn on both sides of the, of the uphill side of a snowmobile bridge that exists to straighten approach in both directions and will allow for a longer wheelbase piece of equipment to pass safely. Uh, I, I think we had a unanimous consensus that every action that the landowner and ourselves will take will leave the uh, class four portion that we're gonna impact better than it is now mm -hmm. during our operation and at the completion of it. And you should know that uh, Fran Sladek, a certified forester, has been overseeing the, uh, the forest plan and it's been reviewed by the Lamoille County Forester uh, Emily Potter, and it's consistent with uh, best forest practices. Looking forward to it. Are the uh, trees that you were you're going to trim? Are those on your property? Yeah. Okay. All the trees are being harvested are on the Phillips land, but we're talking about little saplings. Oh, um, the, the canopy. That I'm are. Sorry. Yeah. And there will be okay. no disturbance of the embankments. The negative portion or most vulnerable portion of that class four is what's called a sunken road where the embankments are maybe four or five feet at the highest or three feet above the very hard base. But we want to mitigate any fur further impact on that portion in particular. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Judy, I'd, I'd be happy to give you this list right. so it's on the record Great. what our um, goals are. Great. Thank, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Um, we should have that on the record. The, uh, uh, we need a motion. I'll make the motion that we approve the improvements of, to Beaver Meadow Road to allow passage for logging equipment to Harper Phillips property. I'll second. We'll motion to second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Motion is passed. Thank you. Number four, review de delinquent property tax accounts. Sarah Haskins, delinquent tax collector. Um, our delinquent tax policy says that taxes are due in full. Um, May 15th, um, for those of you new on the board, then um, I send a oops, you forgot a letter right away that same week. Then on June 15th, I send a second letter that says, um, oh, did you get my letter? Did you, are you out of town? Did you forget? And then in July, I send a third certified letter saying, um, if you don't pay in full, then um, we're, we're going to um, turn everything over to the attorney to start tax sale collection and then it then it's sort of like when does it fall that there's a meeting after that um so all of these um people on this list that i gave you there's uh, 15 landed homes and there are nine mobile homes that are unlanded on the list um it totals about forty thousand dollars it's um pretty typical to what it usually is at this point. Um, and then our policy is we um, typically hire the uh, town tax collector attorney, who's Jim Barlow, to send demand letters. They cost $75 uh, a letter. 
So my recommendation is that there's one property that's less than $75. I wouldn't recommend spending them that much money to collect that one. And I know we had this discussion last year, but for that one property that is under 75, do we just end up writing that off? No, we can't write it off unless um, the BCA, um, okay. uh, not the BCA, the Board of Abatement if, um, meets and wants to write it off. Um, no, I will sometimes send a letter, not every month now, but then starting next year when they become delinquent again and then there's more money on it, then I'm going to start the monthly reminder notices and add this year to that next year. Do we know if any of these were affected by the flood in July? Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, I've only heard of a couple properties and they're not on these lists. Doesn't mean that they weren't and I don't, they didn't tell me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I do know that the um, first home, um, so one of the one of the mobile homes at Starred has um, requested an abatement hearing. I'm going to schedule that once we get through all of our tax assessment appeals that were on statutory deadline. Um, but the first one, I've um, been working with her, but she has not bra brought back the paperwork. Her mobile home burnt like 18 months ago, mm -hmm. and so um, I've encouraged her to apply for abatement. Um, but I, I haven't received anything from her yet. And she's definitely still in town? No, she's not even in town anymore. But she knows that it's there. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's an interesting one. Yeah. So Sarah, yeah. If, I don't know if this is a quick answer, but once the demand letters are sent out, and assuming there's not a favorable response, then what? Then the attorney starts the tax sale proceeding. Um, I will bring you a new list of the people that after the tax, I'll, I'll come back and I don't know, November, maybe the beginning of November, depending on the timing of everything, um, with a, a new list, hopefully a smaller list, and you will decide which ones you actually want to pursue tax sale because there's a cost to it. So it's the weighing of, um, what's what's worth the money to try and collect and why do we wait one more year and then um, if there's they either pay up or then it's a larger amount and then maybe it is worth it it costs like average of nine hundred dollars for tax sale um, if it goes to tax sale and um, we can recuperate 15 percent of that of of the the tax that's owed but we can't Recruit, re, recoup the full amount, um, and we only can recoup the seventy-five dollars of all these demand letters. Also, if it goes to tax sale. So once we send them out, those it cost us seventy-five dollars. So if they can come in and pay whatever the amount is, but we never recoup the seventy-five. We will only time. recoup it if if they don't pay and it goes to tax sale. To tax but it's sale. in our favor to spend the $75 and get them yeah. money. And my other question was, Julia Campagna during the discussions talked about um, putting in a special policy this year. Um, what would it take for us to alter this policy? Yeah, I, th I think with the current yeah. tax bill is about to come out. I'm so sure. you could tell me, no, you don't want to send the demand letters and we just sit on these. Yeah. Um, the, it's there's the, um, it's the weighing of is that helping people because then right. it gives them another year and so then um, they become more in, more in debt. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that Julia was mentioning also mm -hmm. was looking at um, how we bill interest and penalty. Right now we bill 8% yeah. um, penalty, which is really high. Like I forgot or I was sick or I went to the emergency room yeah. Um, it's that flat rate that's set by the it, uh, statute and unless the voters vote to change that oh, then okay. it's um, stays that way so it's something that you can discuss when you do the warning for town meeting for next year that would come in effect for the next tax bill okay but in essence because it hasn't the voters haven't voted on it we have to do what um, the statute says 
And I've been collecting some some okay. information about it. If that's a discussion that you no, that's want to have in to, the future. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, because that because um, it could be this next tax bill mm -hmm. that uh, mm -hmm. unfortunately it, it doesn't. Yeah. Um, changing the interest and penalty doesn't apply to this. What yeah. could you could say you want to give them three more months? I know um, during COVID the board is, they gave three more months. Um, um, for people, I think the governor even mm, recommended it yeah. um, during COVID. But during COVID, we've got no recommendations from the government's office about in regards to the flooding. Uh, not that I've heard at um, at the moment. Um, so typically, if we send out these demand letters, I hear what you're saying, um, yeah. Laura. Um, if we send out these demand letters, I. I'm, ass I'm assuming that for most of these properties, we probably don't know why they haven't paid, assuming that there is a good reason right now. If we send out these demand letters, would we then, as has happened in the past, typically find out why they haven't paid? Not yet? necessarily. It, it depends on if the taxpayer approaches me to have a conversation about it or not. The it becomes a lot more serious. I do tend to hear more after the demand letter goes out, um, just because um, the fees are a lot more for them if it goes to tax sale. So if they can avoid tax sale, um, it's better for them. From this list, I've only heard from um, one. So I know the mobile home that, that burnt and the one that's asked for an abatement and I know that there's another one there that's going through a divorce and they're trying to finalize the paperwork of who's responsible and who gets the home. So, but um, we can, that's the other one. So we could waive those three to not send a letter to, correct? You could choose not to. Well, I, I certainly would recommend that we not send to the three. I think the person, the mobile home in the current needs to have a letter to know that they haven't been forgotten. We, they, they need to, they need to like follow up and, and contact you with some information. But we know that that, we know for a fact that the house is gone. Yes, yes. Well, so that so the actually, house isn't gone though, right? It's it's still on site. The mobile home. Yeah, yeah I don't. You but it's not livable. Right. Yeah, but yeah. and she owns the property. It's so. On. So she's not currently, there's no tax bill for this year. Actually, this is all old. This is years oh, worth of old tax bills okay. that accumulated. She's not getting any new tax bills. So all of these oh, okay. balances, if they were in arrears last year and they were little, um, they're <coughs> rolled over. I just gave you the totals. I see, okay. So we don't have, um, the, uh, we don't have any kind of record here of which ones are rollovers just for I have it on my desk if you want to see it. Yeah, but just be curious. Okay. Well, you don't have to go get it right now. Okay. Yeah, um <laughs> cuz I don't know that that would affect is that going to affect anybody else's decision? Okay. Yeah, I think it's from my information. Yeah. Okay. I'm thinking, you know, by sending out these letters, we're sending a reminder to these property owners mm -hmm. that they do have back taxes to pay. But we've been and there's sending no, out letters. And there's no Right, but yeah. this is a demand yeah. letter. It's this going to have a much stronger language to it. And to let them know that they are getting close to a cliff where things are going to get costly for them. That's yeah. so. Yeah. And unfortunately, it's a burden on the town, but I uh, kind of see it. We're doing them a favor by reminding them from a lawyer that this is something we need to, have need any to of take these, advantage of. Have any of these people gotten this letter before? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. From so, the lawyer? Yeah, there's some of these people that just are on this list yearly. And how come we haven't, those haven't gone to? They do, and then they, the lawyer sends a letter and then they pay up. Oh my gosh. Sometimes it's a vicious cycle, unfortunately. What a costly, vicious cycle, a crazy cycle. And there's no kind of state statute that we can stop that, right? <laughs> no, or we would have. Some people are struggling to pay the bills and they pay it when they can. Yeah. Some people forget about it and it's tucked in a drawer and they don't see my letters. Lots of, lots of different scenarios. I guess my thought is that we send the letters and 
in those hard luck situations, we hopefully will hear back. Hear back from them. Yeah. You know, that the letter will push them to come in and talk to Sarah or talk to somebody in the town clerk's office and give us a little understanding as to what's going on. I'm assuming there's language in the letter that says that they need to notify us. The or reasons? No. no. No, I don't think so. It, is, it a, is it a certified? They have to sign it's the a letter? certified um, letter. So my last ones were certified. Uh, I'm not sure if Jim's demand letters are certified so, yeah, or not because he mails them. My letters were all certified, so they had to sign to receive them. But it's um, some people don't aren't comfortable sharing their stories yeah. or their hardships, so it's yeah. they they're not required to tell me why they're not paying. Yeah. You know, I understand. I'm just wondering if, the, the, if, if it's worth having language saying, you know, if you are indeed, you know, please let us know. Not saying you have to, mm -hmm. you know. Um, just I'm just trying to leave the door open so that we don't have this mystery, you know. Um, you know, I don't know. Jim would have to advise us about the legal, but it, it would just be nice to if we could get some answers on some of them, but. We, but what would we do with the answers? Well, if, you know, um, talking about changing the policy, it would give us some numbers that, you know, are they just not paying it or are there people, are these people really struggling? Do we need to make exceptions so that we can help them? Yeah. Is what I'm trying to find out, you know. And that's I would what just I... be careful about yeah. being subjective and yeah. being fair and equal to all taxpayers. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think you would, I don't think you could do a case by case basis, but I think that if you wanted to change your policy and how we did things so okay. that everybody had that opportunity. Yeah, um, that makes sense. Yeah, I see the, understand the, we'll start setting precedents and subjectivity. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna make the motion that we send demand letters to each of these properties as listed except for, um, yes, the $35.76, thank you. And um, can you add Jim Barlow's name to that And that uh, Jim Blar Barlow will write those letters and send those letters out for the town. Okay. I'll second that. I have a motion and a second, any discussion? Uh, when, is it worth um, sending out a $75 letter to the 105? Or, bet, or better yet, the 80? There's an 80 one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, you could, I mean, you could cap it 125. You can cap it 100. Um, to me, it, it, I would either pick 75 or I'd pick another number and, um, yeah. and, and pick that number. I mean, I would say 75 is our cap. You know, I, I know it's, it's crazy to send out a $75 letter to collect an $80 bill, but... It's, well, yes, it's seventy-five. So one hundred and five. We're gonna, we're gonna be forty dollars off. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I would say send it anyways. At least we're on the black side of the ledger. So uh, we're paying seventy-five dollars for let per letter. Are we also paying Jim Barlow time, or is this seventy? This is a, this service fee? is a flat fee. Okay. For the letters. Hey, forty dollars is forty dollars. So. I think we have a responsibility of the taxpayers yeah. to collect I taxes. Do. Yeah, and keep it consistent. Yeah. Okay, until we can get the um, the penalties changed. Okay. Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion is passed. Right. Thank you, Sarah. So I think you're up next. Yeah, I am. So I I know it's a little early to be thinking about this, and I forget what it's called on the I agenda. Said, uh, so I'm probably community, community just gonna community. ramble a little bit. <laughs> um, so I, I want to start a conversation now about town meeting. I know it's months away, but I really need to start planning now. And um, so one of the ideas that I learned from Duxbury in another town when talking, when we were before the debate of were we going to move to town meeting or were we going to go to all Australian ballot was what, what are other towns doing? So Duxbury has this day, it's called Everybody has their say day or something like that. Uh, they do it the first Saturday in January. So the budget is not finalized, but the budget is pretty close to being 
towards the final stage. Um, the warning is not finalized, but you have an idea of your big ticket items that you're gonna have on the warning. And they do a presentation, they do a PowerPoint presentation on the budget. There's discussion only. They do a, a PowerPoint presentation on any big changes that are gonna be on the warning, discussion only. So they get um, feedback from um, the community, the, the discussion that I'm, I'm really hearing from the community that uh, they're happy we're moving to Australian ballot because of the participation and the equality of people voting, but they're really going to miss having that discussion and the community feel. Um, so that that would uh, um, accomplish having that discussion. They also invite all of their social service agencies, everybody that's asking for them yeah. the money, and they all do a presentation. They all have a booth. You know, you invite yeah. like Ron is always there with the conservation committee or the library. Yeah. You basically have town meeting without the voting piece. And it's um, a way for the community to get together. They do pie um, for breakfast. Uh, we always had the soccer trip going to Europe has always, you know, done our food for fundraiser for them. Um, so just an idea to throw out there and, and think about um, having something like that. Um, I just wanted to bring it to the board. And the other thing that I'm going to need to know and think about in regards to town meeting is, um, so we're all Australian ballot. And you guys will need to decide. It's also the school's going to have an election that day, their annual meeting, and it's a presidential primary. But the presidential oh. primary. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy <laughs> with the presidential can. primary um i cannot in state statute we cannot mail all the ballots why because everybody that's going to vote in the um, presidential primary you are going to have to declare for this election only which ballot you want you're not declaring you're that party but which ballot and so we can't mail out ballots because we don't know what ballot you want. So therefore, everybody's going to need to request their ballot for the presidential primary. I don't know what the school is thinking about if they want to mail out their ballots for the budget or not. And I don't know what you guys are thinking about if you want to mail your budget, your um, our ballots for town meeting or not. But. Um, I need an idea sooner rather than later because I need to figure out um, working with a company to either hire it out or I need to start um, buying supplies of envelopes and everything and the state's working on a contract. So um, I need, a, and you don't need to decide tonight, but I'll need a decision sooner rather than later so that I can, I know my answer when the state contract is ready so I can get better Can you give pricing. us a time frame? Like a, a deadline. Yeah, when do you need what, a, a date? Um, December one or something like that. No, I probably I probably need sooner. I mean, um, Burlington reached out to me six weeks ago to ask what we were going to do because they want to do what we're going to do, and they were planning six weeks ago. Whoa. Yeah. So we're behind. Um, so no, I would like an answer in November. November. So no, one of the meetings in November, you want an answer? Mm -hmm. Okay. Probably the just question. just because you never know with supply and demand, and yeah. um, if we, if we go the route of mailing everybody their ballots, it's a it's a lot of envelopes I'm going to need. Um, so if if somebody requests, they would tell you whether uh, whether they're doing uh, Democrat or Republican, and then you send those out. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a mm -hmm. lot of work. Mm -hmm. Wow. Next year's an election is that, year. That oh, March is morning. when our primary is. Mm -hmm. But for the election, you don't have to declare. Mm -hmm. Oh, you still have to declare for the mm -hmm. election? I thought yeah. we um in March. So in March oh, you in have March. to declare yeah. it's it's not a secret. The primary. In the yeah. primary because um the Nash that's a federal and federally they are requiring that information from you. Then we're gonna vote again in August for the statewide primary. In Vermont, oh. we don't have to declare. So in Ver so in August when you come to vote, we're gonna hand you all three ballots. You're gonna choose the one in secret you want. And then you're gonna recycle the other two. What a waste of paper. Okay. Yes. 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 If you have any feedback, I'm meeting with the Secretary of State tomorrow. <laughs> so that would be the same way, Sarah. Like if you, if, if we mailed, I would have to say I want 
this party's ballot and you would mail it to me. So I'd have to oh. reach out to you to get that. So yes, yeah, so this so the state the presidential primary in March, the state will not mail you your ballots. You have to request you have to request your state ones. In August, the primary, the state will not mail you your ballot. They think it's um too much money to mail everybody all three ballots. Oh, yeah. Um so you have to, so you have to request the state one in March. You have to request the state one in August. But come November for the presidential election, they are mailing everybody their ballots. Yeah. So so public listen because each election next year is going to change. I'm sorry. I'm I'm really advocating that it's not like that for voters, but um, until there's change, that's we have no control. It's going to be very confusing, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah, God. for everybody. So we don't mail out the primary ballots, and we were to do a regular Australian ballot like we've done in the past without mailing them, you would still get the, the choice of the two parties here or wherever we did the election, right? So that would, and do you have any idea? I know the cost for the other votes that we've done has been around $9,000. I don't know what the additional cost was for the, the contracted. Oh, it was actually cheaper to, oh, cheaper. I have that on my desk too. It was cheaper. Um, I think it was about $1,500 cheaper okay. to outsource and have them mail, the company, um, the company mail. So that's then the it only, was doing it in that's kind of, In my head, that's so, the, the yeah. cost for that coupled with the fact that I would have to ask you for a specific ballot. I don't know if that's, that's kind of a clunky. Yeah, that's a clunky. It is. Yeah, and I don't need a decision tonight, but it's really complicated. So I wanted to give you guys the time now to think about it, um, because we because we will we can mail out in. Um, well, that's the presidential. Uh, we could mail out in November, but then that's only presidential. So that's yeah, not, it's only presidential unless we have some so special that's town election. Yeah, that's and I don't know what the mailing. school's doing. Um, I don't, I haven't even, I wanted to talk to you guys before I even talk yeah. to them, but, um, so, you know, one scenario is you decide to mail all the town <clears throat> ballots and the school and the state are request only. Another scenario is the town and the school decide to both mail their ballots. Everybody gets their two local ballots mailed to them, but if they want to vote in the primary, they have to request it. Third scenario is you have to request all three, and then we mail all three together by request only. Or I guess scenario four is just the school wants to mail theirs, but. And if, if you did request only, that puts all the onus on your office, because the a mailing company can't do it then. Right. Correct. But so pre-COVID, pre we, that's yeah, what that's we did. That's still huge. Okay, well, we have lots to think about, yes. don't we? We do. So we have options, but. So given how this all started, we started with that community informational yeah. meeting. Yeah. That's kind of sidetracked there a little bit. But I do like this idea. And <clears throat> I like the idea because it, it will hopefully, um, you know, create maybe not the exact same thing, maybe not a pie social, but something like that. And it fits right in with the next thing on the agenda, the social service approach. Yeah, I sort of put it policy. all on the agenda to, like, um, piggyback. What would, what would you like to know about... Uh, make it, for us to make a decision about the community informational meeting? Um, I kind of want to know, is there any interest at all or not? N like zero interest tonight? Because then the next thing would be, is there a space available? I don't even know. Oh, like yeah. where would we hold it? I, I haven't done any oh, logistics okay. um, for it except for to speak to community members about their feelings and everybody I talk to seems to really like the idea. I like the idea. It all depends upon where this next agenda item goes. Um, you know how we want to deal with these social, this social service appropriations policy that we've all had a chance to read and think about. Uh, well, you know, it, it it will in part come back and affect this idea of a community informational meeting. And I would say I've I've actually organized things like this where you had all kinds of community. Um, not for profits, regardless of whether the town was giving them money, um, because it's a great opportunity um, to have a table and for everybody to to 
like a talk. big town open house. Yeah. And uh, we did one in Waterbury and it was great. And it was just, you know, any not for profit could come uh, who had, you know, services. So it's a really great informational. Um, so uh, I'm just throwing that out there to not just limit it to our appropriations, but yeah, to open yeah. it up to anybody who won. And that's assuming our, we have a space. Our town meeting was always like that. Anybody that yeah. wanted a table would reach yeah. out and yeah. we'd let anybody have a table at it. Yeah. Richard, okay. your thoughts? I think it's a, there's no it's a win all the way around for, for that. Yes, yeah. I've heard from people that the town meeting piece is, was huge, even though the attendance was lower. It was still a good opportunity to get out and, and hear things if you if you wanted to. Yeah. So I'm I'm in favor of it. And Chris isn't here, but I think he would be in favor of it too. So you've got to have a blessing from the board. Okay. To to go forward. Yeah. Find some spaces. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe it'll be enough time period. I don't know if we can get the gym or Yeah, not. the gym is the hard thing yeah. with basketball. Yeah. Um, but the VFW. games are... Oh, is VFW, yeah, VFW big enough? Yeah, there'll be games then. There'll be game, the games are in the yes. afternoon on Saturday, aren't they? Or mm -hmm. at night. Yeah. Um, is there... Um, is the VFW big enough to hold? Yeah. I don't think so. Depends on how many. It holds 150 people, maybe? And what's the community center hold? 180. 180? The community or VFW? VFW. Okay. Yeah, the community center doesn't hold any more than that. That's the issue. We need a big space in town. We do. We need a convention. What if there's any place like at Butternut Farms or Concept 2? Concept 2 doesn't. No. Um. The... Um. I could say the building. Um, they have a big open space, but I don't think it would seat more than 180. Behind uh, Price Chopper. Oh, um, yeah, thank you. Uh, Green Mountain. Oh, yeah. Social, Meadow. social Services. No, the um, Green Mountain. So, so uh, social good. Services. They have actually a great space, but mm -hmm. I don't think it would It'd be any bigger. Um, it's not as big as the gym, for sure. No, definitely not as big as the gym. Um, but if you line up seats, um, yeah. Well, okay. All right, I'll work Thank, and see yeah. what I can find. Thank you. Thank did, you, Sarah. Did you want to address number six or well, this kind of? We can always use an airport hanger. Just okay. throwing that out. <laughs> how about um, <laughs> National Guard? How big is up there? Is it filled up? The cafeterias at the schools might be something more than two. The elementary school has a cafeteria that might work, and mm -hmm. um, UNPA, it could happen in conjunction with a game of one that's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Into. But the National Guard's fine. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I know someone was shaking his head from the back. Reiterate that for Zoom. Yeah. The National Guard. The fire marshal wants to you that. Oh, he, yeah, there you go. There's our resource. Okay. Jason. There's good idea. There. Nobody on Zoom no. heard that, so yeah. maybe just reiterate oh. the comment. What was, what was the, the comment, comment about made? using the cafeterias? Oh, the cafeterias in both schools. Um, that was a suggestion being brought up. People's Academy, middle level, and um, EMS. And speaking with the fire or MES, um, uh, fi uh, fire chief, to actually get capacities at these places. All right. Great, thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. So I'm sort of the next one. Judy okay. and I are okay. going to tag team this All one. All right, sounds good. Because she's been. Oh, okay. Oh. So, uh, Tony Cody, Cody Hill. So the savings of the fifteen hundred dollars was because the ballots were mailed out third class. Um, I currently got that under investigation with the postal inspectors. Um, I'm waiting back for an answer. Um, you plan on sending these ballots out first class with everybody else? Okay, that's that's the right way to do it. Because when people get third class mail, people throw third class mail out. That's it. we all do it. I'm think, sure. Yeah, I think it was discovered that that was a, an unforeseen accident that. Um, has been corrected and that that will never happen again. So thank you for bringing our attention to it because it, it was not unintentional and um, everyone is now aware that it should not happen, it cannot happen it's again. It's never intentional, but the post office is right there. 
Um, yeah, I'm not. Okay. If we yeah. if we don't know what what the answers are, the postmaster's there. That's why he's there. Yeah. That's what needs to be done. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Sarah, would you like to, you and Judy tag teaming? So the social service policy. Um, this was the. I think you have a copy of our current one that was written in 2018. Since then, we've even changed our um, procedures. This was written for town meeting, how, how we were gonna do, do things, written for discussion-based. Um, I, I think it needs to be revised. At the past few town meetings, it, it's what I constantly was hearing about from voters was looking into this policy and how we were um, doing things. The other thing that um, the select board didn't actually go back and update the policy, but what they voted on and they've been doing is making each one of the appropriations come to just a regular board meeting every five years and give an update um, as part of it. But um, now that we're all Australian ballot, one thing that um, I really need to know is are you going to continue to lump your appropriations into one lump sum or last year you voted to make them all individual um, so that was different than what your policy says and so I, I really need clarification on that and then um, Judy had been investigating and got you samples from other towns and um, their policies and what they do so tonight is in for a um, decision tonight is just to start the conversation and to, right. to um, give guidance what you want Judy and I to be working on. Um, I, I, can, I, I had sent out an email as well yeah. to all of the board members with several questions that I hoped that you'd be able to come back tonight and just start conversation around some of the questions that I sent you. What are your feeling? Where are you going with this? so that I can draft a policy um, based on the overall feel of the board to bring back October 2nd, because I need to get these in the mail. I need to get these out to people. Um, so I'm looking tonight for some guidance and then take it home, do homework, and individually you can all report back to me some things that you're looking for. So, and I'll take the consensus and put something together. Um, I was active in trying and uh, soliciting the uh, uh, line item, line item on them, which we did this year, um, but it turns out it was only the new ones, I think. Um, but the other question I have for you, and my understanding is, is that we cannot limit the amount of request until we are a charter. That's not what I heard. Um, so the okay. investigation I, that I, I hope work, I'm wrong. Yeah, the work that I did on this is you may cap any appropriation that you want. All of them, some of them, you can do it any way you want. You can ask them to go out for a petition every year if you want to, every three years, whatever you want. But who did so, you, did you uh, speak to? Jim Barlow. Did you speak to a VL, uh, VLCT? I spoke with Jim Barlow about this. Yeah. Okay. I, did, I just got different information when I was researching it um, yeah. through the state statute. I that, spoke with Jim, and that's what Jim told me. Yeah. That um, We just need to clarify that because... I don't know how much more clear I can get. I spoke with Jim Barlow. Well, like, I'm not sure yeah. where else would I go to VLCT and get their opinion. Well, it's state statute. They, that's what they told me. I'm just curious. Jim, cause, um, yeah, that's what Jim told me. He, they were very clear statute. that we could not set the amount until we were a charter because hmm. Stowe did the same thing. I'm not, I, I'm yeah, just, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, just, I did ask, but I don't know. We just, yeah. So, yeah. Laura, what your understanding would be that when you say we can't set the amount, meaning you don't mean that we can't warn what they've requested, but rather that we as a select board can't adjust what they've requested? No, that um, we can't go in and say that the maximum will uh, allow okay. everybody is a thousand. Okay. And uh, when I was researching it, um, that I was, I asked about it because Stowe does that. Stowe revamp, revamped theirs because their theirs had gotten so out of control. And, um, what Stowe told me and what VCLT told me uh, was that the state stat, unless you have a charter of governance, you, that we have to abide by the state statute. But now Jim Barlow is saying 
giving us different different information. So of course, um, Stowe has a Stowe has lines. We, we read it in here, and it was no more than one percent of the operating budget, and that's their that's one way that they're capping it. Yeah, um, uh, they do have a charter of government. So, I would so. just say, just to get some feedback to Judy, I would say, I also. I think this is what Laura said, but I also like the idea that these are voted on separately. There's been a lot of discussion for a for decades about the idea that when voters go in and vote for these social these uh, social service appropriations, that there's no way to separate out, separate out what they want to provide money for and what they don't want to provide money for. And last year we were able to do that, and I would. Number one, continue that. Number two, I think if a social service is new to town and asking for an appropriation, I think Salvation Farms might have fallen into that category last year. If they're new, that they should have a petition. Um, also, if we have a social service appropriation that was voted down, in the previous year, and I believe we had three, if not four of them last year, that they would need to come back with a petition as well. But if you're a social service whose appropriation was, you voted in favor of it. Um, so if you're not new and you weren't voted down, and I guess, and if you're not increasing your appropriation, I guess those would be the three things. If you're new, you need a petition. If you were voted down last year, you need a petition. And if you're increasing your appropriation, you should provide a petition to support, to support you. Um, I would also just throw in there um, that, and I, I've said at several meetings this year that it's really nice when these social services come in and present to the select board and present to the public. It's like Salvation Farms was is again a really nice example. I mean, I think there was a few of us in town that knew what they were up to, what they were doing. And I think the fact that they came in and gave the presentation that they did might have put them over the top. I don't know, maybe they would have they would have gotten their money anyways. But um, I think those presentations are good. There is 23 social services on our list that we're looking at tonight. And um, I'm not sure 23 presentations every year ma every year makes sense. I think that's a lot, it's a time consuming. But I would say, uh, and I'm just gonna throw out three years that every three years that each one of them provides a presentation. And maybe it happens at that, that pie ceremony that, or the pie informational meeting that you're talking about. Maybe that's their presentation, but that they do it. And I'm throwing that every three years because um, this board has to go back to the voters every three years. And, uh, you know, we, we're, we're not elected for any more than three years. And that's probably a very good thing. And uh, these people that are asking for money, they should come back to the voters as well and explain why they want the money at least every three years. So those are, those are some things that I would throw in there. I would say, um, and something I was pitching for, um, was that uh, line item, yes. And I think every year they should be line itemed. So, and I also, if we can, I think we need to limit the amount, um, partially because to have, you know, people coming in, uh, you know, the range is just, crazy and you know as working in not-for-profits the you know most most not-for-profits know that you can't have all your eggs in one basket um, and that by allowing huge sums you know it becomes this big, big dependency and it gives us a much better uh, you know budgeting thing there are towns that do a maximum of say fifty thousand dollars um, and that they have to come through a process and then it's <clears throat> the select board decides who's getting this 50,000 per year and they do a um, you know a, a graduated situation where you know 20 percent's going to medical 20 percent's going to child care so that uh, there's it you make sure there's a di uh, diverse diversified giving um, I think that's a fairly com very complicated 
too much for us this year. Um, but I certainly like would would like to see limits on that um, and make it more equitable that there's a max um, because otherwise we just become an open wallet and it makes the budget more predictable. Mm -hmm. Sure. Do you know if the towns that are doing that, are they um, doing it by petition or are they just saying you don't need a petition and um, they're doing it with an application form? Because that might be the difference. It if, might be. If, um, if we require a petition, right. then I think that's where mm -hmm. you get what you ask for. But I think if you remove the petition and go to the application and say we're going to yeah, that's then a very, that, yeah. that might be the difference. Yeah. So that's a really good point that Sarah just raised. And that's a very that complicated. What Jim is talking about is that when you're when your citizens, when the social service appropriation people have gone out to your citizens and your citizens have signed a petition saying we're going to give fifteen thousand dollars to home habitats for mm -hmm. whatever, then you have to follow that because your voters have spoken. So that's where I think where it's talking about caps. I think if there's a petition out there with a dollar amount on it that they've gone out and got names yeah, that would make for. sense. So if you don't do a petition, then the board can ask. Yeah. That's what I, that, I yeah. think that's what I'm understanding. Yeah. I just, again, I think it starts getting, you know, when you look at what we have right now, it's, it's <clears throat> there's a huge, huge range. Um, and given the current situation, um, you know, it's it's really tricky. I just think, you know, we just can't, it's not good for the town to be an open budget and, um, you know, for people coming in and asking, you know, ten, fifteen thousand dollars um, $15,000, you know, if all of a sudden one person gets it, they, it starts, it just, I don't know, it's going down a rabbit hole. And I just think if, if we, as a town, could cap that, you know, this is the max and we would have to find the legal, but, I certainly would like that because I just think it's um, it's crazy that we just can't, you know, um, limit the size of the appropriation. Yeah, yeah, that it just can't be an you know because what are we going to do if somebody goes and says gets a petition that says I want fifty thousand, which they could. I mean, it's you know. Well, then um, the public can vote it up or vote it down. Well, you know, uh, again. You know, there were some surprises on this last one, and you know, um, there were. Yeah, because yeah, you know, if you don't, if you don't really do your research, you know, and let's face it, everybody's a, is selling their organization, and uh, that's. I just think we have to get some control over it. Richard, do you? I I think that the. Can you grab the mic, Richard? Just pull. It I think the uh, the this right here, the three people, the three appropriations that didn't get approved. To, to speak to your point, Laura, uh, Laura, is that the taxpayer said they didn't want to approve those. Yeah. But we have some fairly large, you know, fifteen fifteen thousand yeah. dollar numbers here that were approved by the taxpayers. Um, so I think that that kind of solves that, and because you don't know what I I feel like we may not know what some of these organizations need to provide the services that they do provide to our community. You know, the fifteen thousand dollar one. Maybe they can't live with a five thousand dollar appropriation. I don't. Yeah. I'm not. I'm just saying it. What happens if all twenty three come in and ask for fifteen thousand? You know. I mean, it's it's just it's a catch twenty two, and it's um, you know it's it just sends us down a rabbit hole because then we're technically obligated, and we you know everybody wants appropriations everywhere. So I, I don't know. I, I just know that most towns are doing that now. They're set, they're putting some kind of cap on it. Um, but if you put a cap on it, if you put a cap on it, and this capstone, the say, we'll just say the cap is five thousand dollars, and capstone says, well, I might as well go for all or all or nothing, you know, and, yeah. and say, well, I'm going to go for five thousand instead of the nine hundred I'm asking for. That's yeah. the other, because there's only a handful of them that are over that. Yeah. You know. Well, and that's also why towns have a cap about how much. I mean, there's lots of ways you can go. So one way to do that then, Laura, is, because I, I tend to agree with Richard on this, but, but a way to go with this is if they're over, rather than having a cap, say, I'm just going to throw out a number, say $5,000, because there's only a couple that are, are, are over $5,000. Um, if they're over $5,000, they need to do something 
above and beyond the application. So maybe now you are required to give a presentation. Maybe you're required to be here at the informational meeting before, before town meeting. You know, something like that. But there's something, there's some additional burden that this organization needs to provide to justify, because let's face it, I mean, some of these, I'm looking at uh, Lamoille Home Health and Hospice. Well, my guess is they've got probably a pretty big budget, and that's why they're the biggest appropriation. And we all know what hospice is doing in this town, and yeah. you know it's interesting that that passed rather mm -hmm. easily, and yet it was the biggest number. But yeah. I'm just kind of throw that out there as an option. Yeah. Can I yeah. say th just a, one more thing? Going back to what Judy was requesting earlier, I did like the language from VLCT. Mm -hmm. I think it fits rather nicely with what we are looking at. I also like the application form that the town of Shaftesbury used. I think it's nice and clean and tidy. And it's well thought out. I did not like what the town of Essex is doing. And I just want to say what the town of Essex does is they put together in their budget a chunk of money, say $100,000, and then they say, hey, you know, if you want some money, you come in and we'll make a decision. So Don McDowell wants $1,000 for his social service whatever it is um, I come in and then the select board in Essex then decides who gets what money so I I thought that was I didn't like that yeah. and we don't have a history of doing that kind of thing in Morrisville yeah. and I, I don't think we need to do that I was actually surprised that that is what they're yeah, doing. that's a more formal but it also gives the opportunity that the next year if you didn't get an appropriation this year that you can get it next year and they and they uh, Essex in particular looks to balance it so that um, kind of all services are represented. That's the point of that is that, you know, to actually accommodate um, more of the services and, and to get it equitable. So I just think the taxpayers... It's a process, that's a whole The taxpayers, I know there was a little bit of feedback from last year that there were so many different articles to vote on, but mm -hmm. at the same time, I think there was an appreciation for them being able to vote on each of the individual articles yeah. rather than doing it lump sum like we've yeah, done definitely. for so many years and i think i know when i was working with polls there were people who didn't know what some of these organizations were even though the town report was out there the, the report from the, each of these uh, appropriation lists was available for people to read before they voted they still didn't do the work they needed to do to inform voters um, and I, I kind of look at this too as a, uh, um, I, right now I don't need Lamoille Home Health and Hospice, but someday I may. And uh, I would like them to have, and, and the people look at their budget and they're looking at a way to formulate a budget and to have it change every year isn't going to help them with their budgeting. Um, all of these programs that are here benefit all of us in this community. Some of us will use them at some time, some of us may not. I haven't had to need the Memorial County food share, but in my lifetime I have needed to do that. So we never know when we are going to be needing these services, and I just feel as a, a, a human being in this community that I, can, I, I would like to see my tax bar dollars helping people who are in need of it. So that's where I am. Voting on it individually, I, um, I think it's probably a good idea that the, the community, the residents, or voters are interested in that. Somehow that the uh, um, uh, nonprofits need to get the information out. We provided it with the, with the town report, but people still aren't going to the resources that's available. But I think your idea of the information day is a great one. And we can still continue having some of the, uh, we were having, I think, five a year come in, or three a year, I think five a year come in um, to talk to the board. The unfortunate thing about that <clears throat> is if we start doing it, let's say, in June, by the time <clears throat> March comes, people have forgotten what the, the presentation is. So it's, a, it's a difficult with the timing to do that. Um, so I think that's, that's my thoughts on that. I also just, for information, um, and I haven't looked at our form, but there's uh, there's a big difference between a state not-for-profit and a federal tax-exempt uh, form. And if you go on to the state, they actually say 
you know, please check and make sure that you're not duplicating services because to get a state not-for-profit, you basically go on and get a form, but you're not tax exempt. 501c3s, five, oh, there's lots of them, are federal not-for-profits, and those are tax exempt organizations. So I think, um, and I don't know how we make that distinction, um, but I think that's kind of important also because it's, there's federal, if you're a 501c3 or, you know, a federal tax exempt, there's very, very strict guidelines um, documenting that you are indeed a not-for-profit. The states, it's a trust situation. So I, that's just kind of a consumer thing that I think is worth stating. Um, you know, and again, I get back to limits that, you know, yes, especially the national organizations, you know, these are huge organizations who have million dollar, um, you know, donations and things and access to millions of dollars um, where our local ones don't. So I think it helps to know whether they are a national organization or a local organization, um, you know, and again, my big thing is, is knowing from the not-for-profits um, that indeed the money we're giving them is is staying here in the community to help our people. Because we had, you know, there was one that we were sending checks to uh, Rutland because her office was in Rutland. They didn't even have an office here. So that's that's just my concern is that if our tax dollars are going to folks, I want some kind of guarantee that that money's being spent in our community. We could ask that question on the application. Yes. That's a good, yeah. yeah. Are you part of a national organization? Yeah. Or do you Do you <laughs> receive funding from a national organization? Yeah. Um, what percentage of yeah, and just what will you know what will these dollars be spent in the community? You know that's my concern. Is you know, are will if I'm giving you you know ten thousand dollars is all ten thousand dollars of that staying in this community or is it? You know that's my my concern. Um, Carly's iPad. Yes. So. The Could noise, you introduce yourself, please? Oh, Kathy Chafee. Um, the, the Noise Museum was one of them on there that was denied, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. so, it, was, no. it wasn't on here. It was a separate article. Oh, it was a separate article. Okay. So they they were denied money. But um, um, this is what I'm thinking. I could totally be wrong. But doesn't more doesn't the town own the noise museum? Yes. So why are they why do they have to ask for for money if we if we own it? Um, they were, I think they were asking for it. And maybe Tina can speak to this. They're asking for an increase in their appropriation. They, they weren't an appropriation at all. No, they were. A they were. Uh, a, well, they were an entity that was requesting a half cent on the grand list in order to fund a maintenance program to yeah. fix their building. And yes, it is a town building, but there's a lot of repairs that have let, been gone by the wayside and haven't been fixed. So there's significant amount of money that needs to be spent. So they are the same as the half cent that the Conservation Commission asked for. Both of those were turned down this year, but they're not the service agency appropriations you're discussing now. They're basically an article. Is that what they are an are? article. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. So am I out of place to discuss that right now? What What is it you, you want to discuss? Noise. Well, I, I'm just curious why they would have to ask for money when we, when we, when the town owns the building, when, and here, you know, it's probably you wouldn't think I'd say this, but um, I mean, if we own the building, isn't it our responsibility to maintain it and keep it up or maybe not keep it? I mean, I don't know. But if if the town owns the building, shouldn't we be maintaining that? And that's what the article was asking, because we have also gone to the public and asked for an increase so that we could get, uh, let's say, buy a new fire truck or a new ambulance. So it's along those lines, is that correct, Tina? Yeah, it's a way of earmarking money specifically that can only be spent uh, at the Noyas. Is raising, you know, asking for a certain amount of additional money to be raised that is targeted only for that building, rather than having to come to us and asking us for, you know, 
a, going to a general fund. Does right. Make- and, and I guess uh, maybe I'm reading into it much more than it should be, but um, you don't um, itemize um, upkeep on the fire department or the building that you're sitting in. Um, Why? Well, I, I just I'm just concerned that no money is ever going to be put into it, and and it's just it's just going to be an eyesore at the corner if they can't get any funding. Just tell us who you are again. Uh, Tina Sweet, finance director. Um, we have put quite a bit of money into the Noise House Museum for uh, previous articles that were voted for with the half a cent for two or three years now. And we've had we've done um, work on the outside. We've done replastering. We've done a lot of work on that, but there's still more to be done. And the reason I think that it is not in our regular general fund budget is because that it needs it needs a lot more work than a regular maintenance type of thing would need. There's no heating plant in it. I don't know if that's plans that they want to put a heating plant into it, but it's. Uh, it, it's in need of quite a bit of repair. So that special fund was created just for that rather than lumping it in with everybody else that needs repairs that are not as extensive. So the the building, the one building and that, that's the general, the one that everybody goes to for uh, general uh, building maintenance, correct? Yeah, our general, well, every every division has a building maintenance division. The general fund would be this building um ambulance has their own building you know uh line item in the budget for repairs or whatnot but the noise house um once they get all the major repairs done will with that half cent will um, disappear and it will be put back into the general fund just like the library's maintenance is in the general fund maintenance and this building so eventually that will go away anyway they just wanted to get some very big projects done so they wanted to earmark special monies for that earmarking, yeah that's a good word thank you Tina. okay thank you you're welcome all right so also too i just want to i brought this with me so i'm required to keep financials town report uh i don't know something else <laughs> so it's here so if you have questions about like what they are this yeah. book might have that information for you Laura yeah I know um, it I'm just saying that you yeah. know uh, when when people are looking right um I you know just book this that uh, has a lot of information yeah. in it and I yeah. do it year to year so thank you so Judy and Sarah did we give you enough information yeah Judy's the one that's um, sort of writing it. Okay. I just want you to be careful that when you're thinking about this, when you're rewriting it, there is a difference between the application process and there's a yeah. difference between a petition. If if a voter brings in a petition with five percent of the voters, they could be asking for two hundred thousand dollars. You can't cap it. It's the same as them bringing the petition to get rid of um, floor town meeting or manager form of government. If there's 215 voters that want something and want to give that money um the, the petition will uh, the voter back petition will will rule will force the issue mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. thank you so could each of you just send me an email yes um, <laughs> outlining more specifically what you're looking for in this policy yes thank, thank you. you and do you have a deadline for that I have to have this draft policy back to you on October 2nd. Okay. So it's a two week window, but you need to give me time to write it. Okay. So I really would like to have like some input within a week. Good. Okay. Thanks for that information. Yeah. All right. Moving on to number seven review and award propane. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh. <coughs> comments. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. Um, Evelyn Throne, Marsville. Uh, yeah, I um, I really agree with the idea of um, having the people have to give a presentation. I would like to make sure that each uh, of the organizations that are in these appropriations know clearly what you've decided about these rules oh, yeah. and that it's all written there. Um, also, I think telling them ahead of time that they're coming in putting putting them on a rotation schedule is is really good 
making sure they understand it doesn't have to be their president. It doesn't have to be. It can be a person they've sent a really nice email to who understands the organization and they know what needs to be said and they can come in and do a few minutes talk because, um, you know, I've been involved in a couple different nonprofits and I just think it's, it's a good community outreach also. Yeah. Right. So thank you. Thank you. Laura Green, Best Street. Um, I want to concur with what Evelyn just said. I was thinking that too, but also I don't know um, if there's a way, maybe a, a, a special column in the newspaper where these organizations, it sounds like there's a balance that it could be every other week somebody just gives a report on, on their activities um, that, that you know the general public can see in front of them, those that buy the newspaper. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Did Tommy Gardner hear that? <laughs> He's on vacation. He is on vacation. He's not here. <laughs> He'll listen to the Zoom. Yeah. He'll watch it. Yeah. So ready for review and award propane fuel bids. Tina Sweet, Finance Director. Um, every year we go out to bid for our propane and number two um, heating fuel. And <laughs> Um, you have some bids in front of you. This year, we sent propane bids to Bourne's, Fred's, Suburban, um, and the only bid that we received was from Fred's for a uh, dollar fifty-nine a gallon. Tina, that's do you know? For oil? No, that's for propane. 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 Okay. What's that? Do you happen to know what we paid last year? Yes, I do, because I knew you would ask me that. <laughs> A dollar and ninety one. So it's thirty two cents cheaper this proposal than last year's. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. That is nice. Something isn't it? went down. Yeah. Um, right. and the number two fuel oil bids we sent to uh Borns, Brasso's and Fred's. We got a uh, bid from Fred's that was the lowest bid at three point six nine nine a gallon. And that wow. is 40 cents cheaper than last year's price. Yay. Wow. All right. And quite a bit lower than our, the other bid we received. Yes, it's quite a bit lower than the other bid. It's almost a dollar. It is. Yeah. It's over a dollar cheaper. Yeah. And it's nice that the both bids have come in from Fred's that are. Yeah. My recommendation is, is um, you have suggested motions, but my recommendation is to go for fr with Fred's for both the heating fuel and the propane as they are the lowest bids and we've had very good luck with them in the past. Good services past year? Yes. Okay, great. Yes. Okay. Do you want these as separate motions? Yes, you do. Yeah. I'll make the motion that we accept the bid from Fred's to supply the town's propane for a dollar. 59 per gallon from October 1st, 2023 to September 30th, 2024. I'll second. I have a motion to second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passed. I will make a motion that we accept um, Fred, Fred's energy bid for number two fuel oil uh, at 3.699 per gallon. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, from October 1st uh, through September 30th, 2024. I'll second that. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion has passed. That was easy. Yeah, I like that one. Number like eight, discuss ending the suspension of parking waivers. You can always switch. Yeah, just I'm seeing if Todd. I'm calling Todd now to see if he. Are you jumping on? Um, it's a, this is Julie uh, nephew. Uh, this yep. was um this was my request to Judy to put this on the um, agenda, and Todd was also going to be interested in this also. But um, my question is whether the board is ready now that the parking has been striped, whether the board is ready to accept the parking uh, committee report to end the parking waiver suspension. Uh, my building, the nephew building has been waiting for a year to get a permit because of the parking waiver suspension and we cannot develop it without this. 
Um, right now, Todd is looking at uh, a nine nine um, parking spot waiver for that building. And uh, we're also asking for uh, permission to um, change the striping on Hutchins Street so it's all on the side of the road that my building is on instead of partly on the side that Lamoille Housing Partnership on and partly on my side of the road because it makes it easier to drive down the side of the road. Right now, the parking striping is on the side of the road where uh, the Lamoille Housing Partnership building is and it stops at where um, the, the Barber building is. If you put it on the opposite side of the road, you can gain an extra maybe 11 spaces, which would be useful. Um, the other uh, part of it is that because Hutchin Street is one way, we're asking to be allowed to use overnight parking on Hutchin Street alongside our building uh, year round because it's one way instead of a two way street, it's easier to plow it. Um, I know the parking committee had recommended that the entire parking, uh, municipal parking area be allowed to be used for overnight parking, right? Uh, the previous plan was to allow only 35 spaces. And, um, you know, that really limits the amount of parking we can use for apartment buildings in that area. Have we gotten in touch with Todd? Todd, you jumped on, correct? I saw him jump on. You're muted. I'm here. Yes, thanks. Thank you. Todd, did you hear um, all that commentary? I heard the latter half. Um, in a nutshell, as I've gotten an application, I have to, by law, respond within 30 days for a nine-unit building at the Nephew family property in the corner of Portland and Hutchins. And the select board has placed a moratorium uh, on parking waivers until the parking lot was redone. And I am uh, reticent to grant that permit until the waiver is listed. The way the uh, sorry, the ban is, li is lifted on the parking waiver. So looking for some direction from the select board tonight in order to respond to that permit. If I do not respond within 30 days, the permit is deemed approved. So I've, we've got to make a decision tonight, unfortunately. It's the way the state statute works. So are, is, does everyone uh, understand what we're talking about? Thank the waivers, um, the municipal lot, because it gets a little complicated. That municipal lot over there. Um, I think Kevin needs to speak to the plowing and waiver issue. Uh, why? I think, I think before Kevin starts, yeah. I want to ask Todd a question. Todd, Thank you. Um, so there's a piece of property Graham Mink is thinking of um, developing and he doesn't have sufficient parking for that piece of property. And so he would be coming to us also, I'm assuming, for parking waiver. Uh, not to the select board. The select board just placed a moratorium. Uh, waivers given up myself for the DRB, but there's a moratorium waiver so the parking lot was redone. Uh, as of right now, the only permit Graham has is for an underground, for a building with underground parking. So as of right now, I would say that's pretty speculative, but. We'll see where that goes. As a general rule of thumb, everyone, all the buildings in the downtown, like the building you're sitting in tonight, is built up fully to the property lines. There's no place to put parking in the building. So every building downtown is generally granted eight spaces. So, for example, Power Play Sports next door doesn't have any parking on site. Their parking lot, their parking is in the municipal parking lot. Across the street above uh, what was Kaplan's is now Moss Boutique. The six apartments there, they have no parking. They use the parking lot and so on and so forth all the way around that parking lot. So generally, the rule of thumb is everyone gets eight or no more. The nephews are asking for nine. The DRB waived the uh, gave them a waiver for a ninth dwelling unit. So I think a ninth parking space makes sense. So I'm fine drafting, uh, approving the permit. The permit's sitting on my desk, ready to be approved. I just didn't want to approve it without the select board's blessing because of the uh, parking moratorium. And then we also have the possibility of the garage being developed. Correct. I don't believe Nick is going to ask for any waivers there. From my understanding, Nick's going to put the parking. Uh, the building's going to be on pedestals above the parking other than the front commercial space. 
but I don't, I don't have a design or an application for that one. For the grams, I have an application. The building's approved for, with underground parking. Nick has said he's going to put uh, street parking, sorry, not street parking, uh, on-site parking underneath the building, but the building will be on pillars. And do you foresee any other building going on that's going to require parking in the municipal parking lot? Um, potentially, as of right now, though, no. The only things that are, are known or potential entities right now are, uh, it's actually Dakota's building next to the VFW, not Graham's. Um, and that's got a permit for underground parking. And that may not work out because it didn't cost out. So they may come back to the town. We'll see. And then there's uh, Nick's building. There's also the building that uh, Lamol Housing Partnership owns next to 46 Hutchins Street. That two-unit building, I don't think, has got probably has a long lease on life. At some point, someone will probably take that building down and uh, look for parking there. Uh, you could say the same for the other building on Hutchins Street, that uh, the little brick building there that has some parking on, on site, though. So you never know. It's hard to pick the future. Right now, the only two things we know of are uh, the two on Pleasant Street, are, which are Dakota Doobie's uh, development and then Nick Don's development. And the, the issue really is winter parking at night. Correct. The select board's policy where uh, a lot of communities, as, as uh, Julie said, they have a winter parking ban where you can park on the streets in the winter just like you can in the summer. If there's a major snowfall plowing event, the white strobe lights go off, you advertise it on the radio, winter parking ban, all cars are off the streets for 24 hours till the storm passes. Then we're back to business because we don't have that. We kind of artificially limit our parking, which limits the ability to have people downtown and, and have units downtown by creating these designated overnight spots where we can't use the streets for uh, six months of the year. But we can only use these certain amount of spots. One of the things, as Julie said in the report, was the report was talking about uh not having the designated overnight parking in the parking lot and just doing a winter parking ban with a flashing beacon when. No one can park in that parking lot. But that may be a different kettle of fish for a different night. For It's probably a longer discussion for tonight. I just need to make sure that I'm okay granting the nephew's permit. It's on my desk ready to go with conditions for nine units, which which was a uh, requisite of a nine uh, parking space waiver, and just like they've done all the other buildings around the, around the parking lot. But you I can't do that because of the waiver prohibition. Sorry, how many parking spots did we gain with the new striping? Uh, that design we did gained about 30 spots overall, and I think about 18 overnight spots. Yeah. Somewhere in the ballpark, give or take on each one, about 30 of total, 18 overnight. Yeah, we have a total right now with a new layout of 36 overnight parking spaces. What did we have before, do you know? I'm not, I'm not sure what we had before, maybe Todd knows. But how many are <coughs> currently allocated? Well, we've agreed to give, uh, 16 spots for LHP and then I would say on an average winter night there's probably 14 vehicles in there overnight if Kevin or Todd disagrees with me Todd, no, do that's, you about, that's about right I've done park well, the last parking site I did was pre-pandemic I went before I went to bed every night I drove over and counted the cars counted the overnight spaces and I did it every morning first thing I woke up and that 10 30 to like 5 30 a.m check showed there are generally five to seven spots available some nights as much as 18 during the winter some nights as much as eight five to seven the most i think i saw was eight maybe nine available overnight in the winter so the lhp building lhp building would probably take a good year to be fully to be fully utilized to be fully rented so we're not going to know the full impacts right away but adding 18 spaces overnight for that building and i i think that building should be relatively parking neutral as long as they don't rent to people with two cars each for all the apartments generally they're there they have one parking space per two units in all their buildings so i think we can absorb with the new design that building just fine so i'm not too worried about them uh taking up all the parking unless they uh rent to people with lots of cars which would be atypical for how they usually do things so i think we're okay with that building that was the point of the redesign well and the my uh, one of my concerns also is that we now have um, a business that's that it can be open it we've got a bar there now so um, there are going to be more people in theory parking at night um, so you know what's our uh, obligation to have parking for the businesses late in the night I mean if we're 
you know, I just think we have to be conscious going uh, forward that, um, you know, we can't penalize the businesses. I mean, it's a catch-22, but what are your thoughts, Todd? The brewery itself, uh, Soulmate Brewing, which makes an excellent mango beer, by the way, um, had it the other day uh, as a little public ad there. Uh, the parking lot, the breweries only open until eight o'clock at night. So other than people getting home oh. from work between the hours of six to eight o'clock at night, I don't think there'll be much of an impact there. Okay. Uh, but the biz, the parking lot is supposed to be, if it's, it's public parking, there's no reserved parking for anyone. No one gets spaces there. I can park there just as much as you can park there. Laura or residents of yeah. the nearby buildings can park there. Uh, it's in the deed. It's from Mr. Uh, Copley's deed. It's public parking. So the intent really is for the businesses. The idea is, the businesses aren't open 24 hours. They're not there at night is to allow residential uses to use the parking lot. The thought process is those people work during the day. They drive to work at eight o'clock in the morning. People come into the businesses at nine o'clock and everyone shares the parking. So as long as people are going to work and, and the businesses aren't there all night and we're not running 24 hour businesses, I think we'll be OK. And none of those businesses are really that use that parking lot around it are really late night businesses. The brewery is only there till eight. So. Maybe there's two hours of overlap there, so I think we're still okay in that regard. Except for Saturday and Sunday when people don't go to work. Correct, yes. but Saturday and Sunday, there's, unfortunately, downtown Morrisville is pretty dead on Saturday and Sunday. There's not a ton there. Oh, Union Bank's okay. closed. A lot of the stuff is closed on the weekend, okay, good especially point. Sunday. Thanks. Okay. Todd, Todd, I've got a question. If we, if we end this suspension, I mean, we've talked a lot about the municipal parking lot. What's... What's the consequence? What's the significance for the rest of the town? Or is this just, uh, are these just parking waivers for the municipal parking lot? Or does this go beyond that? Uh, in theory, the waivers could be granted in the library park and ride. There could be waivers granted at the Bridge Street park and ride that the two park and rides I got grants for and that are built, built in the last couple of years. So it's any of your municipal lots. You also have, um, the little municipal parking lot behind the building you're sitting in off of Brigham, Brigham Street. But that lot's pretty full, so I wouldn't recommend any waivers there. And uh, there's nearly not many open spots at, at the library park and ride either at night. And I'm not sure. I haven't looked at Bridge yet. It's a little too far. For, I don't really go by there very often. So it does have impacts elsewhere. You're talking about how to share the parking. I mean, there's nothing more share, nothing more New Englander than trying to make a good New Englander makes a good Yankee makes good use of uh, all their assets and shares them equally. So there's no point of having a parking lot where there's nothing there at night. There's nothing wrong sharing that. You just want to make sure that no one is left with a short end of the stick, that there's enough parking for the businesses and the residential people around the downtown want to use it at night at night and then drive off where the business is open. That's the way it should work, in, in, hopefully, in, in, a, in a perfect world. So these parking waivers then are only for municipal-owned parking lots correct yes if it was uh someone if someone was if you're doing a private parking lot i mean doesn't you can't we can't waive that it's someone else's private property we're talking about the town parking lots and that municipal parking lot across the street from where you're sitting does serve that purpose because most of the buildings again in the downtown were built to the property lines if you want to have a vibrant downtown with people who live there uh you've got to grant those parking waivers for example the power play sports building next to you was open to the elements and full of pigeons literally the boarded up windows half boarded up windows no developer was going to do anything there until we allowed parking waivers because the developer can't for the seven spots seven units that are there at seven apartments at the time was two parking spaces per apartment gary Bourne or any other developer couldn't have created 14 parking spaces there you can't dig out beneath an historic building to do that you might as well have asked Gary to put those parking spaces on the moon or up up into orbit. So by allowing that parking space to be better utilized by overnight residents, you create vibrancy in those buildings. You create investment. So what was an empty building next to you, Power Play Sports, is now a, a business on the ground floor and seven apartments. And that's how the parking labor is supposed to work. It creates people living downtown. They patronize the local businesses. They also give developers incentive to reuse these older buildings that are actually more expensive to redevelop than it is to build new. So that's part of the nice thing here. We kept to keep kind of the character of our downtown, the character of the old architectural richness of these buildings. And the only thing these buildings don't have is they don't have room for parking, but we have a way to make up, make them whole on that because we have a big parking lot, one half a block over that doesn't get used much at night. We just have to make sure we protect that asset to some degree and, uh, and make sure it's there for everyone in the future. Otherwise the town will be, 
uh, looking for more parking, perhaps down at the bottom of Pleasant Street in the future for another parking area. But for right now, we're okay with our existing parking lot. And I don't think granting the waiver tonight for nine is going to jeopardize us anyway. I mean, I'd love to see the nephews build tomorrow, but I know they've got a little work ahead of them. They've got bank financing to get through and they've got to make sure the nine unit building pencils out. So I don't think you're going to, even if you granted this waiver, if, if you say we're getting rid of the parking waiver tonight, I issue the permit tomorrow. You're not going to see nine cars for the nephew building show up in the parking lot next week or next month, or perhaps not even next year. But uh, in the short term, I do have to act on the permit within 30 days. That's the law. Okay. Uh, Thanks for answering that. I just have just one other question. Then one other question. When this suspension was put into place, is it your understanding that this was done because we were waiting for the repaving and the restriping of the municipal lot? Yes. I requested the suspension just to make sure it's clear out there that, we're no. not granting any more parking waivers until we know what we have. And the intent is once the parking ban starts here in another six weeks, I'll start to go there at night again, 1030 at night, 530 in the morning, count cars, count spaces and see what we have. The, the intent was to take a pause. We're going to redesign the parking lot, make sure that actually happens and then review what we have for over an inventory and then then take waivers on a on a, on kind of a case by case basis as we have availability going forward but we need to figure out what our new availability is with our new big new redesign this redesign adds a lot of overnight parking and basically almost doubled it so hopefully we have uh parking for many years to come now for overnight uh overnight residences and the parking for all the businesses during the day okay thank you um, todd a uh, quick question the yes. um changing the on street overnight uh is that a zoning change no, that's a select board road policy change. You have to make sure you don't want have Kevin want to kill you. And yes. you've got to talk about allowing parking. Uh, some street, some cities and towns do one side of the street only. Some places do just a winter parking ban. You can park on the streets overnight, except when the okay. beacons are flashing and they announce that and everyone's got to get their cars off the road so the road crew can get through with uh, their snow removal equipment. So there are multiple ways to do it, but that's kind of the bigger picture talk about the parking plan and how do we... Yeah. best manage and best utilize our assets while making sure we're not wasting taxpayer money by having the plow get circle the circle the block five times while cars get towed instead of actually plowing snow so that's yeah i just wanted to know so that's for another day but it, it uh is under our purview so thank you correct yeah in, in a perfect world we would have acted on that parking committee report last spring but the select board's kind of been in this budget vortex through no fault of your own on the whole. And really, it's taken up a lot of time and a lot of bandwidth. So now that we've got a budget, and unfortunately, you're about to go into your next budget, hopefully we can get back to finishing the last couple of work items in that parking committee report. Okay. Richard, did you have anything you wanted to ask or comment on? Um, I, I guess the one thing I... The, I, I that, it's not really a question, Todd. It's just that I know that when we entered into this agreement with LHP, they did, they um, gave the town was it thirty three thousand or thirty five thousand dollars to help resurface and restripe the parking lot. Um, and I I just wonder if it's something should we be asking other um, people who are building to contribute to the parking lot upkeep. It's something the select board could do. No one's ever asked for more than eight. I mean, their ask was pretty large at, at, at 16 or eight, 18 overnight spaces. Um, so that's kind of the reason for it. We've Our parking lot design was really poor before. If you go to a parking garage, you drive in little circles in the parking garage, you drive on the inside, the parking was on the outside. Our parking lot before this redesign, we drove around the outside and tried to stuff our cars in the inside of the donut hole, which makes no sense because we were taking the most area for circulation and putting our cars in the middle of the donut hole. So what this redesign really did is let us drive around the inside and put the parking the on the outside. So really, without a, there's a little bit of curb work. Without much expansion here, we added a lot of parking spaces by just being more efficient. But the LHP request, to your point, Judy, was just because normally it's a seven, eight units. We've never done more than eight before. That was more than double that. So we said, if we have to design, we can't, we couldn't fit it. We have a capacity for five to seven spots at night. We couldn't house their 16 cars. So if they wanted a building of that scope to make their uh, financing work, then they needed to help us with the parking lot. That was the reason that we, everyone came to that final solution, I think. Kevin, but if someone, to your point, if someone's looking for more than eight spaces, if if Dakota Doobie or Graham Mink or Nick Donza says, hey, I want 20 parking spots, then say, hey, we need to actually add to the parking lot, fix it, 
do a parking deck at some point in the future and the developer should pay for that or share the cost, whatever the town wants to do. But I mean, really, my opinion, the developer should share the full cost. Okay. Um, Trisha, you have a hand up? I do. Um, and I, I listen to this conversation and I think about the different developers that are going to be involved in here. And if, if you're asking that um, Grim Inc. or whoever it is as a developer, that we are going to give them parking spaces, they should be paying a fee to the town for those spaces. We are plowing them. We are maintaining them. We are striping them. This this whole free sort of thing is just not right for the taxpayers. You know, we are looking to raise revenues. And, um, you know, if you're looking for eight spaces for grab make for over where Cookson property was, he should pay a regular a yearly fee to the town of Morristown to maintain those fees. Why? Why are the taxpayers um, sucking those fees in? It's an interesting point. Right. I I just don't understand why why we are plowing properties that are for a developer or for well, can, a. May I respond to that, please? This is Julie. Sure. I, yeah. I agree that properties along uh, 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 who use the uh, municipal lot for parking should be able to be paying some, but I think we do pay it in in our taxes. You know, my building was recently reassessed from 180,000 to 350,000 and it's still vacant and I cannot develop it because I don't have parking. Every other building on the municipal lot has a parking waiver, I'm paying the same tax as they are, but I can't use those parking spots. And, you know, I know the Union Bank has been using the lot behind the Union Bank for years and years without paying a single dime. Oh, wait, wait, wait. For the, to pay for the, the plowing. So they, no, no, they pay. <sighs> Julie, don't, don't be confused here. I, I was told they were not paying. I'm sorry. The, the I'm Union telling. Bank. Hold on, please. Hello. Go ahead, uh, Jason. The Union Bank does does pay us, and they own that parking lot. Exactly. Well, I apologize if I was wrong. I was told the opposite by someone in the administration. Yeah. But my point is, it's time to lift the parking waiver. The spots are available. You want the nephew building developed? I can't develop it unless I get a parking waiver, just like every other building. The question of what do we pay for that right is a separate question. The question is about the permit. It, it, it shouldn't be a separate question. It is right. a separate question right now because it's we're not, we're not gonna go back and forth. Okay. Yeah, okay. You, Just direct your questions here. So Julie, we, we heard yeah. you and I think Trisha, we we got the message here. I think it's a decision the board's going to have to make. Um any other but anybody else? Okay. Well, I just want to be clear that we're not you're not asking us to get rid of the waiver. You're asking a waiver for an additional spot. No. She's asking for the waiver to be gone. We don't have the right to have any spots right now because there's a parking waiver suspension. Oh, okay. Todd is saying, Todd is saying he needs you to tell him it's okay to grant the, 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 the um, uh, permit. It's for nine instead of eight, which yeah. is one more than some of the other buildings have, but they don't have as many apartments either. All right. All right. Okay, I will entertain a motion. Do we need more discussion? We can do that after the motion. Well, I'll make the motion just to continue discussion if necessary, okay. but I'll make the motion to end the suspension of parking waivers. I'll second that. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Since it was brought up, I know it's not necessarily germane, sorry about that, germane to what we're talking about, but I mean, Tricia does bring up a good point about developers paying for parking spots. Um, this isn't a new idea, but I just think we're kind of late to the party on this one. I think we've already given a lot of waivers out in the past. I don't know how we deal with the history on this one. 
all the businesses and all the residential properties that have already gotten property. Uh, you give up the people gotten, living at the post office, people living above Kaplan's. Yeah, I'm just wondering how that all works out, but I, I, I think she's got a good point. I think she has but a that's good point. But that's not what we're yeah. voting on right now. Uh, and just to be clear, because this is um, a municipal lot, no one's guaranteed a spot. Yeah. We're just saying that um, they can park there overnight a certain number of people are allowed to park there overnight. So they're not, we're not guaranteeing they can't put signage, they don't own anything. Um, so just so that everybody's clear about that. Richard, do you have anything you want to say? No, I'm, I'm, no, we, you don't want to add to no, this? No, I'm good here. <laughs> Go ahead. Laura Green, Best Street. Um, I just, maybe I'm ignorant, I don't know all of these ins and outs, but I heard something about parking all along one side of the street along the Nephew building. Um, and that seems to make a lot of sense. However, for the safety of the residents in, in the um, Memorial Housing Partnership building, like could there be, you know, a five minute parking spot, couple spots like the post office have where people can safely get their groceries in the building and then go park their car or something. It's just a thought I had. That's a DRB. That's not us. Uh -huh. That's a, a DRB permitting. Um, I don't know. Just a question, Kevin. I don't, but I don't, I don't know. But yeah. I think there's a safety issue involved in parking on, on the one-way street, parking on the left side. Just your drivers are getting out on the property side i don't know just yeah. the configuration i don't have enough that well, there's some questions with our local engineer on whether or not we yeah. can fit parking on the bottom of hutchins street on the yeah. left hand side he's unofficially told us that there's he's concerned about when they back out of their his building at the bottom of hutchins street that brick building there that there's not enough room so we're looking into that further to see yeah. uh, with some measurements if that is an option so i don't have a good answer for you right now okay yeah. just got a little more homework to do good. on that yeah, yeah, good. And, and if I could, if I can just interject there, my building extends well beyond my property line, extends well into what looks like Hutchins Street. So I can fit two or three cars alongside my building without, without actually being on a town property. But I would need permission to use that for overnight parking because it's along the street side. I think that's something we can take up at a later time. It's, it's not something that I'm trying to raise now. I'm just saying that, you know, some of that property that looks like Hutchins Street is actually my property. And um, I'm willing to use my property for my parking, but it would mean, you know, for, for two or three parking spots, it would encroach, uh, you know, a couple of feet into Hutchins Street. Whereas on the opposite side of the street, it's all on the street parking. So it, it makes sense to switch it to the to my side of the street because I can use my property and then we can solve this whole parking problem altogether. Again, we're consulting with our resident engineer on that and we'll mm -hmm. see what his professional opinion is on it. Okay. I hope you'll include me on those discussions. Thank you. All right, thank you. So I think, um, Trisha, are you, is your hand up again? Yeah, just one more time. I, 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 me watching this over the years, and I've seen this over and over, I, I would ask that our select board really consider this and don't don't pull this right now. This, I think we there needs to be a lot more discussion about it. You know, when you're talking about a town parking lot, and you're doing waivers and you're parking, you're paying for our town staff to plow parking spaces for a private residential area. I, I don't think this is a win-win for our town. I mean, we just went through three budgets. Okay. So, you know, it's like someone calls the town and says, oh yeah, I saw the town guy plow out the bottom of Joe Schmo's driveway because they couldn't get out. Well, it's just wrong, guys. I mean, I just want you to all think about this and that maybe today or tomorrow we should think a little further about it. But I don't think we should be pulling this parking waiver at this point. 
Well, the thing is, what Todd just told us is if we don't make a decision tonight, uh, the, the, um, the permit goes through. It's approved. Well, you can decide to continue the suspension of the parking waiver. Right. Well, except that, you know, you've already granted these parking waivers to all the other buildings. Right. And that seems to me like. Um, Again, I think we, we, we speak, we got to raise your hand to speak yep. and be acknowledged by the select board chair. Yep. Julie, we're in a, we're in a process. We're going to make a decision. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. We have a second. I just want to be clear that all we're voting on is suspending it, or really lifting the suspension. But when they, when someone comes in, they still have to ask for a waiver to use spots overnight. We're not getting away. Um, we're not saying that anybody can park there at any time. Is that correct? Yeah. That's correct, we're getting, Laura. We're yeah. just trying to treat the nephew family the same way we treated every other property owner around that parking lot right now. Yeah. The only difference is everyone's gotten up to eight. They're asking for one additional. They're asking for nine, which I don't have a huge problem with since the DRB already granted a waiver for a ninth residential unit. So it makes sense for a ninth parking spot at the board. Didn't want to grant the ninth parking spot. Wanted me to limit the parking waivers to eight. I'm okay with that. But really, we can't. We're in the business of treating everyone equally. Everyone around there has up to eight. We've got to give them eight. We can't. We don't have to give them nine. But other than that, how you got into Judy's LHP point when they wanted 18 or 16, then we get into a different discussion about sharing costs and upgrading facilities. But everyone around them has got eight. We've got to at least give them eight. We, otherwise, we can, they can go to court and we lose badly in court. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I just want to ask Kevin, do you do you have anything any concerns with this? Anything any thoughts you want to share? Not to put you on the spot, but <laughs> the board's about to make a decision here. I want to make sure you've got an opportunity to say something if you want to. So Kevin Barrows, Highway Superintendent. So as far as the waivers themselves, it was truly because of what was happening in the town and what, what was happening with the parking lot at the time to be updated and upgraded to where it is today. That's why the board suspended giving out waivers. So at this point, I have I don't see any reason why they yeah. you can't unsuspend that yeah. and, and give out the parking waivers. Again, to Laura's point, this, anybody else would still have to come back to this board and ask for a waiver for parking if any other development was going on around that parking lot. And again, it would be up to the board to make those decisions. And, and as far as the, any of the parking on Hudson Street, we are looking into this and there is issues with how they would come out of the old um, real estate office and if it, because their parking spaces are on their property and they're close enough together so that when they back out, they have to come pretty much straight out of the parking which takes up most of the road. I mean, most, most people's vehicles are anywhere from 18 to 24 feet long. Okay. Yeah. So that's still something we have to look into. Okay. Thank Good. you. Good information. Thank you. So the motion is... Go ahead, Jason. I just want to speak oh. on oh, sure, behalf sure. of the police department because we're the ones that enforce this winter parking ban. Mm -hmm. So we have had 16 spots for LHP that we've been granted already. There's only 36 spots, so that leaves 20 spots for the folks above the post office, Kaplan's power play, and other buildings that I, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, when we tow vehicles for the parking ban, uh, we get a lot of grief. Uh, it's worse than arresting somebody, I'm pretty sure. So I don't want to set us up for failure to where we're allowing over 36 people to utilize this parking lot uh, for winter parking ban and we just don't have enough spots. So, so I think Todd said there were 14 in addition to the 16, correct, Todd? So this gives out a, a 30? Pro approximately, so then you're around 30 or so, and then you were gonna yeah. allow nine more. I mean, we're not, we only have 36. Oh, okay. 36 yeah, So this spots. would take up all 36 then? We if potentially. potentially over. Potentially. It's not a it's not a one for one thing. I think there's actually more than 36 units that rely on that parking lot right now. But a lot of the units downtown don't have cars. For example, the eight units LHP owns over the post office. There generally fluctuates between only three and four cars of those eight units. So uh, there's not full one car per unit at the Demars apartments above 
what Moss was slash Kaplan's used to be. So there already are more units than there are parking spots available. It's more a question of usage and capacity. But there's nothing that regulates, hey, you only can have one car in this parking lot. So- nope. And that, yeah, that's why if you had a, a landlord that decided to rent to a bunch of people with two cars, we could be in trouble really quickly, two cars each apartment. But that hasn't been the case historically. So I'm really not worried about that at this juncture. I'm a little worried about it. Yeah. Okay. We did talk about um, having a permit at one point. I think Eric brought that up when he was on the select board, that that was a possibility of looking into. And so that might be something we can look into down the future, that, that we permit at evening parking in the winter. It's a possibility. We did speak about it when we did the redesign on this parking lot. Um, but it does, I mean, there's a lot of logistics involved in that, so. And the foundation that we've got to deal with. The... Right, I mean, we've already given waivers to, I don't know how many different buildings, so. Uh, go ahead, Jerry. Uh, Jerry Throne, Morrisville. I'm just wondering uh, how you're going to control which vehicles are allowed to park there and which ones need to be towed. I'm wondering if maybe the town should issue a parking permit and that might take care of situations where there's a concern about an apartment having two vehicles rather than one. So right now it's first come first serve for those 36 overnight spots during the winter time. Uh, as far as parking permits, that was discussed in the past, uh, but again, it's several different buildings in the village that have been given uh, the waiver to park there. So it's just gonna take some time and some logistics to put something in place. So it's a possibility. And then we got to have somebody to enforce it yeah. as well. So those 36 spots are, are marked. Like if I drive in there at night, will I know which one of those is the 36? I think we're still waiting on the signs, yeah, Kevin. Sure. <laughs> Kevin Burroughs, Highway Superintendent. We ordered signs for the overnight parking, winter overnight parking only. It's on both of the outside rows. So both outside rows clear back to the other end, not across the EV area. But just up and down this way. Okay. How many? Do you, sorry, Kevin. Do you own, and those are that's thirty six overnight along the sides there. With the total for both sides, yes. Yeah, that's okay. thirty six. There's thirty seven, but one is a handicap. So if you count the handicap, it's thirty seven. Right. But otherwise, it's thirty six. Right. But again, there's no guarantee uh, for anybody that they can. There, there's going to be a parking spot for them. First come, first serve. Yeah, and that's part of the foundation. I Correct. agree. Yeah. Hope the one more Thank makes you. that clear. All right. Um, I, I had one question or comment. Um, Julie, I think you might have reached your limit. Yes. So we're going to. Uh, I the- only wanted to say the 36 parking spots is the current overnight. You don't, you're not, you're not wed to that. The parking committee suggested that you allow all the spots to be open for overnight parking. Okay, we're, we're not, we're not gonna, we're not gonna, work. we're not gonna discuss that tonight. We're gonna look at just the parking waiver and discuss that. How we're gonna address that? Thank you. All right. What's the pleasure of the board? Well, I, I will. Go. We have a, we have a, we have. So, a, what is the motion? Yeah, the motion. The motion is to end the suspension. Okay, just want to make sure. And we have a second. Okay. So all those in favor? Aye. Aye. (laughs) (laughs) I'm opposed. Opposed. Wow. I'm going to vote for it. So the motion is passed. Just lifting the suspension. Yes. All right. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, Todd. Thank yeah, you. thank you, Todd. No problem. That permit will issue tomorrow morning, and hopefully, we'll have a rehabilitated and brand spanking new uh, nephew building sometime in the not too distant future. All right. Number nine: Discuss discontinuing Stubtown Road and Lamphere Road. Are you looking at me? Yes. Um, Would you like to take so there's been a lot of discussion about discontinuing roads and I didn't bring all my notes with me tonight. There's <clears throat> approximately somewhere between 15 and 20 roads. I think it's 17 roads that were suggested. 
to be discontinued. Um, right now, we've narrowed it down to Stubtown Road and Lanfear Road. And uh, I think at this point, you know, I've, I've received a, a lot of emails. I, I think the entire select board has received a lot of emails on this, um, on this issue from specific landowners, property owners that are affected by this. The, uh, we, we do need to make a decision, I think. I think we need to decide on this. Um, and right now we're only talking about these two roads, but <clears throat> one of the comments that I have received from many property owners is we need to know what's going on so we can plan for this winter because we need to, we need yeah. to decide on whether or not we're going to need to hire someone to plow, plow these roads. Um, I did go around, I did visit all these roads. I took some notes on all these roads. Um, I do remember Stubtown Road and Landfield Road rather well, so I didn't bring my notes tonight because I know those were the only two we were going to talk about. However, the process here, the process does require site visits by the board, uh, does require public hearings, and we would have to make this decision on a rather tight timeline. So my recommendation is to not discontinue any of these roads this fall. I think this is something we can come back to. The Planning Council has mm -hmm. um, put this on our plate and I believe our Superintendent of Highways put it on our plate as well. But we've obviously had a lot to talk about the last few months and we haven't gotten to this and it is getting close to the 1st of October and the snow is gonna start flying soon. I think we need to make a decision and my suggestion would be to not discontinuing a road is taking a class three road and throwing it up. Uh, these aren't class four roads, these are class three roads. So it, it is a big deal and, uh, and we need to be careful how we approach this. Um, you know, we have to do the right thing. We don't want to set the town up for liability. We can't just decide willy nilly to not plow these roads anymore when we've been doing it because that sets us up for liability. I think at this point, in my personal opinion, these are two roads that should be discontinued, but I don't think they we, we are ready to do it right now. And I think in the springtime, we can look more carefully at these two roads. And I think out of the 17, there's a few others that should be on that list as well, but I don't know that we're ready to do it at this point. Um, can I, Todd, were these two roads, did they not request to be removed? One of them did, yes. Stubtown would like to not be plowed anymore. Landfear <clears throat> has known this may happen for about 10 years. They're just enjoying the kind of private plow service the one house gets while they can. But they're, I don't think they're, Kevin can answer that too. I don't think they're surprised to stop, but Stubtown wants us to stop plowing. So if, <clears throat> so I would say, I, Don, I agree with you, but if, if Stubtown wants us to stop, then we should stop. Why should we? force it upon them and save a little bit. Right. I, I, can, <clears throat> I can agree with you on Landfair that <clears throat> if he's enjoying it, um, we should make a consistent policy rather than just arbitrarily, you know, yeah. uh, stopping. But if Stubtown Road doesn't want us to, heck, save it. Todd, do we have to have a site visit and then a public discussion even if the, oh, um, the person living on Stubtown Road is okay with us discontinuing um, taking care of it, do we still have to go through that process? I would defer to Jason, your interim town administrator. That's the town road process isn't me. I'm the permit guy, private property development guy. I'm not the road guy, but I think the answer is, with that being said, I believe the answer is yes. You need to either say it's going to be a class four road. You could say it's going to be a legal trail. You could throw it up entirely and say it's a private road. You have multiple options at your pleasure as, as a select board in terms of no longer caring for it as a class three town road. Yeah, there is a process in place, and okay. we need to follow it no matter okay. what the scenario is. We can't is. just willy-nilly make a decision. Here. Okay. Fortunately not. Okay. I, I don't disagree with you at all, Laura. Mm -hmm. I, I am very much in, yeah. you know, I've already said this before you spoke, but I, yeah, we do have a landowner that wants us to, wants us to stop plowing the road. It's just a matter of the process, getting yeah. it done, getting it done properly and right. abiding by our own policy. Yeah. I mean, I think if there's one road, we should try to do it. Yeah, the reasoning, you know, why we're, I talked to Don earlier about possibly delaying this till the spring is 
we have three employees now here that are doing double duty, essentially holding two oh, jobs. Yeah. And our bandwidth is pretty well maxed out. Okay. Um, this is something we feel we could put off till we get a town manager in okay. place. It's just gonna, one less meeting, one less set of minutes, you know. Understood, that that argument I understand. That's So should we, do we table this or we just move on? How do we handle this? Do we just move on? Don't do anything? I, I think we can just move on. Move on. OK. Yeah. Right. Judy, we'll like bring it, yeah, we'll bring it back in the spring. OK. Um, OK. It's not, I mean, it's not, like I said, it's not going to go away. We'll just, we can revisit this in the right. springtime. I didn't know okay. if we had to make it a formal, like, tabling it or yeah, something. No, if we have to go to, OK. So number 10, approve travel policy. So we have this in front of us. I, I'll put my two cents in right now. The only thing I saw on that that um, caused me to pause was a uh, second page, which is page 31 of 33, and it um, third paragraph, just that um, cost of overnight lodging we reimburse traveler has to go to a multi-day event or 65 miles or more. And I'm just thinking about weather. So you're going to a conference in Burlington and um, the weather's pretty bad should we force our employee to drive all the way back here because it's not 65 miles away? And so I'm just wondering if there could be some kind of clause in there. It does say that um, the last paragraph is any exceptions to this policy must be approved by the town administrator. So maybe that would be covered there. I think it would be. Okay, that's that would be my, my only concern, and, Richard and Laura. Yeah, my um, my concern is is that employees travels with the expenses over a thousand dollars. You know, the national standard is uh, the reimbursable uh, travel expenses. Why are we not just going with that? Why do we, it's so much a day for hotel and lodging. Why would we not just use that? Why would we recreate it? Do you know what I'm talking about? No, I'm sorry, I don't. So the- I, I think I know the answer to that. Okay. okay. I think it depends on where the person is going. Because obviously going right. to New York City then instead of going to Burlington. So you'd have to have different rates for different areas. And I think that's why they yeah. put there that are, in there. There are different rates. If you pull it up, if you pull it up in the Right, and I think it references in there yeah. that standard. Yeah. The, I mean, again, if you if you go on to the uh, you just pull up per diems, it gives you a list of what the rate is per towns. Um, and to me that's a more you know consistent then I I'm just never in favor of saying anything under a thousand okay we're not even going to question I I don't I have problems with that but it has in here yeah. that you have to have well, your receipts and and yeah. all of that uh, it, and anything under a thousand it does it does get your department head has to approve it the town manager yeah. slash town administrator does not though um yeah okay I mean I just the whole world uses travel expenses. I'm not sure why we aren't referencing travel expenses or the, you know, the per diem rate. It just seems like that's the um, industry standard that, you know, if you're traveling to so-and-so that you're allotted the. If you look on page 31 at the bottom, it does say per diem allowances are reimbursable for in-state overnight travel. That is a multi, so it does use the per diem. I just think they want to make sure that anything over a thousand is approved by your supervisor. Oh, okay, I see. All right. And so it's not un okay. It's not unlimited. It's just that if it's otherwise, it goes straight to per diem. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you, Richard. I think it's fine. Okay. I, I didn't see anything. That Done. You might have talked about this when I stepped out, but the bottom of the first page, that last paragraph, says the town of Morristown may issue prepayments for airfare, lodging, rental vehicles, and event conference registration. Proof of cost will be required. What happens? <coughs> what happens if they don't go? So this happened, oh, sorry, this is Judy. This happened with EMS, and a conference was postponed because of whatever sickness, COVID. You know, and they just we have, they gave us back our money, okay. um, or they just rescheduled and the participant went. Okay. So I think that's all part of it. So if I just wondered if there should be a statement in there to that effect. That's all. Mm -hmm. The rest of this I thought was good. Okay. 
So do we, shall we approve? So is there- Are you just saying add a line, Don? Yeah. Just to, just to yeah. say that in the event that- if, if not attended, then prepayments will be repaid. Reimbursed, yeah. Yeah. Unless, well, yeah, unless the event's rescheduled. Right. Yeah. If it's rescheduled. Yeah, that's a, you don't want them to pay and then have to pay them back out if it's rescheduled. Okay. All right. We can add that on. All right. And Judy, what was the 65, the, are you okay with? I just, it does have in here that, um, the exceptions can be approved by the town administrator manager. Okay, so you're okay so with it's weather related. I'm, I'm thinking people be aware that it's an icing condition that you shouldn't be traveling anyhow. Okay. All right. So ready for any old business? Do, do we not need a we formal a vote on this? Motion on this. We, we oh, should we, should, before it's written, just to our suggest that's it? I can bring you back the changes on October 2nd <clears throat> if you're giving me a, a motion tonight. That that? We just have that one change? Just that one, one change. Just so if you're going to give me a motion tonight that that one change is fine. Okay, we, that. we can do that. And I'll, yeah. Yeah, good. I'll bring it back for signatures. You're okay. Okay. Oh, oh yeah. Wait, just one second. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's get a motion and a second first. I'll make a motion to accept the Town of Morristown travel policy as written with the exception to state uh, <laughs> that the employee needs to reimburse the town in the event that a training is not attended or something to that effect. Yeah, good. Got a motion? Do have a second? I'll second that. Second. Any discussion? Sarah Haskins, town clerk and treasurer. I don't report to the town administrator or the town manager because I'm an elected official. I work beside that position, not for that position. So I'm just would like some clarification that um, who, who would I ask or report to well, if, if there were questions. I report to yeah. well, um, And do you report to us? Well, yeah. I mean, but. Yes and no. Oh, wait, wait. I report to myself and the voters. Yeah. So I'm a and and Mitzi reports to me. She how doesn't. How handled it in the past? I I approve what my department does. But I I would think it's, that if you were as going, long as it's within my budget. If you were going to be be reimbursed, you'd have to follow the travel policy because Paul or Tina would not reimburse you, <coughs> right? Well, there hasn't been a pause. <laughs> That's a pretty gray area. Yeah, um, sorry, not? Sarah. That, I didn't mean to complicate. No, uh, no. Thank you. Uh, I would have to say, if I had a guess, <laughs> that I would have to reimburse Sarah and her um, employees as long as it was in her budget, because her budget is voted by the voters. She's okay. not bound by the policy like the rest of us are. But I also don't have authority to go above and beyond her budget that the voters have voted for. So I think that's your safeguard you're looking for. Yeah, okay. Yep. Great. Great. You're right. Thank, Thank you. you, Tina. <coughs> All righty. <laughs> well, because even, yeah, as an elected, even a manager wouldn't. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And approved policy travel has passed. Uh, old business. Any old business, Jason? No business. All right, I like that. Um, approve warrants. May I have a motion, please? I'll make a motion to approve the warrants. And a second. I'll second. I have a second and a motion. And um, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Any reports from the department head? <laughs> <laughs> it's a busy night. Sarah's night to talk tonight. Um, and. And speaking of travel, um, Elizabeth, Mitzi, and I were very fortunate last week to travel to Lake Moray to attend the um, Vermont Clerks and Treasurers Association annual conference. And we had um, amazing classes on um, writing clear and concise election um, websites from a, a federal organization. Uh, we did a really inspiring diversity and equity training with Ideal Vermont that just like I wish you guys were there to hear. Um, we did some First Amendment audits, um, internal financial controls and prepping for audits, um, and some information about cemeteries and um, burials. It was, we kind of split up so that um, we were all seeing all the different topics that were 
um, offered, but it was um, really great. And I was awarded um, my advanced level one um, certificate, Vermont certification for clerk and my <coughs> advanced level one certification uh, for treasurer at the conference. And I think Mitzi and Elizabeth have now completed their classes. So um, for a year from now, I'm going to be telling you that at next year's conference, they got their certification. Oh, congratulations. Nice. That's great. Congratulations. Um, yeah. okay. And uh, the question of the week that everybody wants to know, where is my tax bill? So yes, <laughs> normally we would have mailed tax bills out this week. We are still in that 30-day appeal period. So on the agenda for September uh, October 2nd, um, you'll set the tax rate, and then um, we will hurry up and as fast as we can, and we will mail the tax bills out the week of October 10th through the 13th. So they'll be out a little bit um, later than usual because we, we can't set the tax rate uh, yet. Are we going to be, like, the, the, usually taxes are due November 15th? They still will be due on November 15th. Oh, okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Town Administrator's Report. A few things. Kevin, do you have anything for department head or? Okay. <laughs> a few things. The There was a comment last week about the town manager update and we are still on the 30-day the hold that Sarah mentioned that will be on the agenda for October 2nd. Uh, we did hand out the job description a draft job description last week for the select board. Uh, the question about a new union being formed, we can publicly say now there is. Uh, it's made up of employees from EMS and general government. We are looking uh, to hire somebody to help with Zooming minutes for that occur in this building. We have the $5,000 that we budgeted for last year, so we'll be putting together an ad and putting it out to try to find uh, someone who is willing to work a couple hours during the weekday nights. We just started our audit. This is a two-week process. Uh, they do our actual audit first, and then they'll do a single audit, which is, covers all our grants. So they've set up shop upstairs for the next two weeks. Last Thursday, we met with FEMA. They came and toured our uh, areas that were damaged from the storm in July. Uh, everything looks good on that end of things. We have a little more work to do with some paperwork for the Oxbow, uh, just for like the basketball court, the pavement. We can They're going to cover that as well. So we just got to get an estimate on that. And that's it. Did you talk to them about the trees? Uh, no, because these are more the money people of FEMA, not the ones that would have an opinion on that. The logistics, okay. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. Any questions for Jason? All right. Um, select board comments. Who would like to start? How about Richard? I'm just trying to get my feet wet, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> Laura? Um, yes. I. Um, since I've been on this board, there has, well, I actually talked to VLCT about this, about just, uh, and previously having been uh, watching, just about communication. Um, and I know we're in a really topsy-turvy place right now, um, but, uh, you know, I get frustrated because I literally show up here and find out that things are in motion that I didn't know about or... Um, so I have concerns that, first of all, that no select board person um, can at any time speak or take action <coughs> representing the select board without the select board approval. I feel like that's sometimes happening where people are, you know, get excited and they take initiative and they're plowing ahead when they really, it hasn't been discussed. So uh, I've asked for actually a, a an agenda item just to set up some clear channels for communications um, in this case so that we're all on the same board um, and again there were things I've asked for an agenda item on the Oxbow because I know there's lots of different departments and I'm hearing that you know this person's writing a grant for swing set and this person's writing a grant 
you know, we have two new we have a new rec position, um, and, and yes, the job description says write grants, but I know most departments, you know, have like, uh, you know, technically neither development or the rec have a an official boss. So I had just recommended that perhaps they come in once a month or every a couple of months just to make sure that not everybody's writing the grants for the same thing. And also because we are the select board and we're elected um, to help give some direction where we'd like to see the town go. Um, Cause I just feel like everybody's gung ho and out there working, but I don't know that we're all working together and in going in the same direction. And, ex and it, again, especially I don't want us to be spending a lot of time duplicating efforts, um, you know, and so I, I think it gets down into communication, just trying to get us all on the same page so we know what everybody's kind of doing uh, and also moving us forward. And this gets back to what I, I talk about is we're trying to get a manager. We're about to start applying. And I just think it's really, really important going forward um, that we get our house in order, and I think communication is part of it. Because when, if, if um, you know, if people are watching us to see what seems to be chaotic, um, you know, they're they're like, I don't want to walk into it. So I've also, you know, I want to put forward again is that we do this analysis because I think if we can do this uh, analysis where they come in and look at all the departments, we have solid data that we can hand over to a manager to give so they can move forward. Um, and again, so that we know, because we're, we're starting to sign union contracts, we're doing a lot of things. And, you know, I just, I really feel that we need that data. I've heard it from people, uh, you know, that want, just want to have this overall study. It's commonplace. And I think we need to do it so that we have some strong tools to hand whoever comes in here. And we have a, a strong plan of communication going forward. Um, Don? Uh, just a couple of things. I think this might have been said at the last meeting, but I'm, <clears throat> I have a feeling it was. I'm going to say it again. Um, we, had, uh, we had some renovation work done down at the Oxbow, and uh, Percy came in. There was an original bid of $16,000, and just so you know, we were billed much, much less than that, actually half of that. So. Uh, kudos for for him or for them to do all that work and not bill us the full price so there was significant savings there also worth mentioning that uh, the do Hamilton pit I believe it's my understanding has uh, stopped processing but we have gotten our load of gravel and sand out of there that we were hoping to get and that also seems to have been very successful and uh, Again, kudos to, and that happens to be Percy as well. So that's worked out very well for us, and we've ended up getting a lot of sand and gravel at a uh, at a cheaper rate than we had originally budgeted. And that happened in 2023, and hopefully that can continue. And the last thing is, uh, since I've been on the board, there's been many opportunities for board members to extend appreciation to the people working for this town, and I. I and and that's always been it's always been great, but I think we are at a point now where there's a few people that I just want to highlight that have done, that have gone well above and beyond what is expected of them, and um, I just want to mention a few people. Jason, you've took, taken on this interim town administrator's job, and uh, I know when you took it on, you weren't thinking that you were going to put anywhere near the hours into it that you've put into it, and uh, and you. You've continued to put those hours in, and I just want to extend my extreme appreciation for to you for for all that you're doing and hanging in there, because there is an awful lot to do. Um, Tina, Tina, you've stepped up not just as the finance director, but also stepped up in HR. We don't have an HR director right now, and we're all those of us that are involved in this know that uh, there's a lot going on behind the scenes, and really appreciate you. Um, taking on that role, which is more than you had originally asked for, I'm sure. And Judy, Judy's our administrative assistant, but she's not an administrative assistant. She's an assistant town manager, assistant town administrator, call her what you want. But 
is putting in tremendous hours. I came in here on Saturday to pick up my packet and lo and behold, Judy's in here working away trying to get things done for us. Uh, <coughs> these three individuals, and I have a little bit more to say, but these three individuals have really stepped up. We've lost two significant positions in this town. And I, if I ever did think they weren't important, I don't think I did, but um, I certainly understand the importance of our town administrator and our HR director and, and what it's meant for these people to step up. And I would say our town clerk has probably stepped up as well because there are voids and vacuums here and there and everywhere. And so when these three individuals are doing all the extra work that they're doing, Sarah and her staff and frankly, the whole staff in this building and our, our department heads have had to step up. And I, I think it's really important for this community to understand the people that are working for this town and all that they're doing and all the extra hours that are putting in. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. And I'd like to, um, the municipal parking lot looks lovely. And I know, I don't think it would have happened without Jason and Judy. I don't know if Kevin, if you how much of a hand you had and all that, but thank you for getting that done. It's been, what, three years we've been waiting for this to be done? So it's great. Um, and just to the board, um, before you came on, Richard, a uh, couple months ago, um, I'd like to do a, get a board training for all of us. Um, it's working on trust with the board. So when I get Chris, back and we have a full board i'd like to to for us to probably to meet on a different day um but get availability from all, everybody to see when they're available to come in it'd be a business meeting but it would just be our business be open to the public so um just so we can do some board training we've never had that before i think it might be beneficial um and that's all i have community comments go ahead <laughs> yep. uh, Tony Cody, Cody Hill. I wanted to know where the town highway union contract was for uh, signing it, or or what are they? Uh, whereabouts is it? Negotiation, and can I know that information? Well, I think it's it's still being negotiated. Is that correct? It's still being negotiated. And when is it anticipated on being signed? The negotiations I, you know, <laughs> when, we when, know. I mean, when it is, when both are, sides is, agree. Are the taxpayers going to know or no? Oh, yeah. Before it gets signed. Taxpayers will know when both sides come to an agreement. You come to an agreement after you sign, though, right? Yes. So then we're going to be the second ones to know. So how does one, how, how does the taxpayer get something on the agenda? Um, write an email to uh, a board member, write to me. Jack. And, and then it goes on the, the next agenda? It doesn't or? necessarily go on the agenda. If you look at our agenda, Tony, we have a lot of business we have to take up that, that's town business. So it depends on when we can put it in and if the board feels it's relevant to have on the agenda. Well, this is town business. It may be. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other? Um, go ahead. Hi, Christy Snip. Um, talking about parking makes me anxious, <laughs> but I do like the idea of having fees associated with um, giving away our parking, especially the overnight parking. Um, we don't ask our developers for impact fees, um, given the fact that it took us three times to pass a budget. I don't think we're in a position to overlook an opportunity to increase our revenues um, pretty much anywhere we can. So that was an interesting part of the conversation tonight, and I think it would be um, great. I don't know if it could be an annual thing that anybody who's using it pays, or if it's a one-time thing when you are granted them, or, but I think it's a conversation to be had, and I think that there's a lot of development that's about to happen um, on the municipal lot, and more people are gonna be asking for more parking, so it would be great to have that sorted out. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Carly's iPad. Um, Kathy Chafee. Um, 
I don't know if you can answer this, but who negotiates for the union? Is it a town employee or do we have an independent negotiator? So cur currently it's the town administrator, the department head for the department that's being negotiated, the finance manager, and the HR director. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Alexander Sear. Hi, I'm Alex Sear. I live in Morristown. I appreciate that we got a little bit of information on the um, town and town manager process um, as part of the town administrator report. And um, I do believe I read in the News and Citizen that 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 is going to be a new search process, which is one thing that I um, was wondering about last week. So just I hope that we get a lot more applicants than than apparently we did for um, or than the town did for town administrator. You're not alone. <laughs> Thank you. Any other comments? Yeah. My name is Tom Cludia, and uh, I'd be remiss to not talk about this com coming budget. And I'm, I know uh, probably uh, uh, the people that I'm talking to here, I'll be the negotiators uh, from that you're going on right now with the uh, maintenance people. I hope they understand that the the how important it is to hold the line on this this first negotiation with this first union here to not quickly give in to the union to fight for everything they get because what, uh, Judy we won't forget what happens last year as as voters as reg registered uh, citizens we will remember. And remember last year's budget or this year's fight. We don't want to go through that again. The main issue were the salaries and the increases. If we have to seek, seek, go through that again with this union because they're too high, we will face the same dilemma of a failed budget again. So these negotiations that are going on right now are extremely, extremely important because you're going to be negotiating again with the other group, that's EMS and the others that are coming up. So I hope they understand that and take this extremely, extremely serious because it, this next year's budget, I believe, is going to depend on it. And if it fails, what's going to happen then? is going to be, you're going to come back and positions are going to have to be eliminated. So I hope they understand this. We want to be united on this budget. And, but if it's the same deal as last year, we'll have problems again. And we don't want that. So I'm just saying, I'm sure they're aware of it. But again, I just want to let them know how important that this is. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, no, no, that's it. Just, just your two minutes to one time during community comments. Uh, uh, I didn't have two minutes. What? You had your turn. Um, so uh, <clears throat> you want to read the uh, yeah. this point? No. I move to go into executive session to discuss a personnel matter because I find the premature general knowledge, public knowledge, would clearly place the public body or person involved in the substantial disadvantage. Um, I have a second to the motion. I'll second that. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I move to go into executive session to discuss the appointment or employment or evaluation of a public officer or employee subject to T1 VSA section 313A3 to include Interim Town Administrator Jason Luno, Interim Human Resources Director Tina Sweet, and Administrative Assistant Judy Alberi, and St. Albans Town Manager Dominic Cloud. Do I have a second? I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. 
I move to go into executive session because I find that premature general public knowledge of labor relations would clearly place the public body or a person involved at a substantial disadvantage. I have a second. I'll second. Sorry. I have a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I move to go into executive session to discuss labor relations, re, labor relation agreements with employees under the provisions of Title I, Section 313A1B of the Vermont statutes to include interim town administrator Jason Luno. Second. Second. I have a second and a motion. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we are in executive session. Thank you. Thank you, folks.